further ado, Dr. Jacob Stoyle. Thank you for the introduction, General Woldridge. Good afternoon. I've met, tried to meet most of you since this. There are a couple I haven't yet had a chance to say hi yet. I'm Dr. Jacob Stoyle. I'm an associate professor of military history at the United States School of Advanced Military Studies, or SAMS. Um, that means I'm a military historian, but it also means I really like division and core operations. That's kind of where I live my life. What we're going to talk to, what I'm going to talk to you about today is a historically based guide to the different operational approaches you can take towards urban terrain. So if we think about the course going from here's the problem to here's some solutions, I am not giving you a solution. I am giving you your choices and then I'm having giving you some of the considerations, advantages and disadvantages of each of these choices. Now, some of these choices are completely unfeasible for us as a moral military. That doesn't mean I'm not pointing out that they exist for you because your adversary may use them. So we're going to run through all of that. Before I get started, I also have a quick thank you to Major Silve and Sergeant Matthews because honestly, General Woldridge did his best. I'm a last minute type of guy, right? I think last year it was 3 a.m when I delivered the slide deck. They got me to deliver the slide deck early this time, and this morning I'm like, hey, I want to make a change to it because I've noticed some formatting stuff. So the, uh, the ability of support to kind of roll with that, I really, really appreciate. So let's go on, and let me tell you what I'm go not going to talk about and what I am going to talk about. So there are going to be historical cases in here. I am on the whole not going to go into super depths in them. Those are for questions. If you want to talk to them, happy to talk to them. But they're the kind of places that you as a staff can start to look to get more information on some of these approaches to think about in detail the pros and cons and applicability. Really, this is meant to get the party started. It is not meant to be the answer. It's meant to present you a range of answers. And the final thing of how do I want to do Q&A in this? We do have some time reserved for Q&A in the end, but we're going to go through a whole bunch of different op approaches. So if we hit one and you have a question about it, don't save it to the end and make me sit here clicking all the way back like 30 slides to try to get to what you were talking about. Jump in, interrupt me, raise your hand. I um, run a seminar system, so I'm really happy for disruptive questioning. So if there's a question on a slide, if it's like a general giant question about everything I'm saying, or if it's you, Doc Stoyle, are completely wrong and have no idea what you're talking about, save that question for the end. If it is, however, on any particular slide, let's have it then, so that way we all have it fresh in our mind. All right, so what are we going to go over? We're going to talk about some general considerations for developing operational approaches. We're going to then go into some offensive options. At the tail end of the offensive options, we're going to discuss some that involve radical change, i.e. ones that we are currently not formatted, not structured to do, but are options out there. Then we're going to talk about the defense, and I'm going to break talking about the defense into two parts. First is preparing for the defense. And second is conducting the defense. And in preparing, we're going to talk about if you have a long time to prepare and if you have a short time to prepare. For some of our European partners and allies and our Pacific partners and allies, the long time to prepare one is a really key consideration that we don't talk about, where you believe war to be on the horizon, but it is not here today. today. So you have a year, two years, three years to continue to ready yourself for the defense. And for our SFAB brethren and sistren um, who are going to help our partners prepare for these things, these are really good pieces to think of. We're then going to go into short term where you have X amount of time unknown, but the enemy is at the gates and you need to start preparing for that. Then finally, we're going to move a little bit away from traditional offense and defense and talk about defending against urban areas, which is something we don't really talk about terribly much. And we're going to move into a little bit of consolidation of gain, security and stability. So let's talk some general considerations. First thing is kind of we've circled around it on this course. What is urban and what is rural? Literally, the definition of rural is anything that is not urban. You can look it up anywhere. It comes from actually originally Anglo-Saxon wasteland, and wasteland was just a land that was not in a city. So this gives us a really unhelpful frame of analysis. And urban, there's a million and a half definitions, but they all involve population density X in a level of built up area Y. But we all kind of know what we're talking about, right? And it isn't rush-ish. But we do sort of know what we're talking about. And so rather than defining the frame, I'm going to leave it as the we all sort of know what we're talking about approach and hope we can have a conversation based on that. <laughs> 
Some things to think about, um, as Anthony King in the UK raises, the issue of force density, that cities, even before the recent years, can suck up so many forces that if you're campaign planning and you've got an urban area, but your objectives are, your campaign objectives are beyond it, or not in it, and you want to reserve forces to continue to maneuver in non-urban spaces, you're going to have a challenge. The urban terrain will suck up a core if it's dense urban terrain. It can suck up a certainly into sustainment resources, as we've discussed more than that. So the force density requirements are quite a significant general consideration. The argument, and actually Stuart in the helicopter successfully reminded me that this argument is not true, um, but there's a common argument there that terrain favors the defense within the urban environment. And this is quite importantly, not necessarily true, however, often can be true, especially if it is a well-prepared defense. Um, so a little bit more nuance of that. Obviously, as we've talked about civilians in the battle phase, space, one of the other principles that we haven't really talked about and that I kind of asked about in Rajesh, and they kind of were like, well, we don't really worry about that because they're only in here for 24 to 48 hours, is route security and casualty evacuation in your zone. So we've talked about the possibility of infiltration, right? You clear an area and it's re-infiltrated. This creates a route security problem much more similar to what you might think about in COIN, possibly worse, but within the LISCO context. Intelligence in the urban area, there are lots of sources, but we also have lots of problems because there's a lot going on. Um, thinking about follow-on operations and stability, almost every time we've talked about the urban terrain so far has been taking it. Well, in our doctrine, taking it is but the first step of many right? Moving beyond it, moving through it, getting to the next objective. This is a conversation that you need to consider when you're considering your operational approach. When are you going to culminate? And can you move on to follow on? Can the force who takes it also begin the transition to phase four and stability? Do they have that capability or not? These are all things that you need to consider in your operational, in picking operational approach. To me, this all comes down to two key principles. One, if this was going to be a badly written problem statement, by which I mean a question, um, how do you maintain combat power, tempo, unit coherence, and avoid culmination in the urban air environment? That is really the central question we're dealing with in all of these operational approaches. Because if you fail to do any one of those, you are going to almost certainly fail in your operation. And the last thing to think about is we've been playing in our discussions about an enemy who stays and fights the urban space. One of the challenges of the urban space in LISCO is the ability of the enemy to utilize it, or you to utilize it if you're on the defense, inflict pain, and then move away, break contact. There are lots of ways to break contact in the urban space. The other general consideration I want to bring up, because we haven't really talked it a lot, is phase four. But I don't mean phase four by itself, because phase four in the urban space is continuous. It is not just that, hey, I finished phase three, let me move to phase four, now it's stability. A very smart British officer who was la here last year pointed out that for every 10 meters you gain, you gain 10 meters of stability operations. You cannot wait for to begin stability until after combat operations cease. There are far too many people. But it's not just that. Phase four is phase zero, one, and two for your transition to the defense. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth when we talk about preparing for the defense. If you're not doing phase four as you're moving through the city, you are not going to be well set up if you need to transition to the defense as part of your plan. So thinking about phasing and transition. Within those phase four considerations, there are some things that we don't really tend to think about too much. Um, and that's issues like normal medical needs, right? Military supply chain for medical, really well set up for trauma. Great. How many people in a given urban area are dependent on nitro to stay alive on a daily basis? Insulin. How many children are going to be born during that phase three operation? Right? Both under international law and law of armed conflict, civilians in your area are your responsibility, so their normal medical needs are your responsibility. But secondly, in this phase four is phase zero, 
it is absolutely critical that you don't have an epidemic of dying babies and pregnant women because you have failed to take that into consideration as a planner. If you have everyone's grandfather dropping dead in the street because you didn't bring nitro with you, that's on you. Right? You should be able to start anticipating these normal medical needs. And yet, our supply chain and our medics are not super up on them. And those are things to get up on if you are starting to do this. In addition to these, you have issues of public order. And this to me is a real, oh, by the way, another one is mental health care drugs. So lithium, really, really common. If you start to see a breakdown in mental health and behavioral support in your area, you're probably going to see uh, start to see an uptake in violence. So you need to be able to provide those until another actor can bring this in. Now we can hand wave that out and say, hey, NGOs will do that. State Department will do that. USAID will do that. Somebody else will do that. First of all, they're not going to do that in that first 48 hours while you're still in phase three, right? If the shells are dropping on a block, they're probably not going to have an NGO running lithium up onto that block. Just going out on a limb there. But secondly, I want you to think, I've been, you know, I've been saying here, use the interagency. Recently, I was given a statistic that there are more members of military bands in the US military then there are foreign service officers in State Department. Which is a shocking statistic to me, but should talk about capacity. So in a lot of cases, you may think this is somebody else going to do it, but it's going to fall on the military because the way our government's budget is right now aligned, that's who has the resources to do this. Public order is another one. How are you maintaining public order? Again, if you talk to the people at Rajesh, they say that's not the brigade's job. It's not the division's job because that will happen, you know, 72, 96 hours down the line. This is not the case. If we go back to 2003 in Iraq, there is a significant amount of evidence out there that shows that the loss of public order in Baghdad during the first 48 hours of the U.S. occupation lost us a lot of ground with the civilian population, especially in terms of looting. And actually, in some of the cases of looting, such as looting of pharmacies and hospitals, made our ability to then rely on that civilian infrastructure that we were counting on for phase four go away. So public order isn't something you start 48 hours, 72 hours out. It's something you start during phase three. And this is what I'm trying to get you to, that phase four is continuous. You have to think from where does the city normally receive daily supplies? When we did our flights over LA, you could see the huge warehouses out of LA that the, day, that the small distribution trucks roll out of, that the large logistics trucks roll in and the small distribution trucks roll out. So if you've cut those off from the city, those warehousing are where the city's daily resources come from. So if you want to think about critical objectives, possibly those distribution centers then come onto your list so you can start not relying just on your own supply chain, but rely on what's warehoused and stored in addition. And then lastly, one of my favorite topics to talk about because I'm in, yeah, question in the back. Sorry, maybe you don't have them in the US as well, but a lot of the, the European cities have been some um, Museums with historical um, um, monuments and collections of historical um, stuff and technical is always a always a prime object for losing by We absolutely have them in the US. I live near the Nelson Atkins Museum, which is like one of the greatest collections in the Midwest of artifacts from all over the world. Actually has an entire Roman fountain complex that was rescued from the British Army, which was using it as target practice in Italy. Um, but it is now one of the few surviving full working Roman fountains in the world. So yes, that's the kind of thing to think about protecting in that establishing of public order is are there critical museums? Is there critical cultural landscape? And we'll come back to that issue of culturally significant landscape later on on this. Yeah. Would you like consider that like, so again, in upstate New York or anyone that lives in a snow ridden area, they have huge uh, locations where truckers get salt to then salt the roads when it dumps snow as well as those transportation means of actually having trucks on the road. Like, would that be something? I would consider that absolutely something you need to look for in IPB regardless. So you could say I'm going to upstate New York in, you know, 
summertime, I don't need to worry about that, but you do because if those are depleted by the time you get to follow on forces, that's a huge logistics undertaking. I'd also say things like salt piles are something you need to assess on a C-Bernie element because it's usually not just salt, it's usually a salt magnesium mix that can be highly toxic if inhaled or if it enters your water supply. So thinking about say, uh, protecting it from a Ciberni element as well. And that's what I wanna to get to. There is a lot of complexity if we think of phase four as part of phase three, but it's complexity that you owe to division and core to be able to do because it will absolutely come back and bite you, not even in the end. It may come back and bite you in 24 hours. And that 24 hours is where I get to planning for epidemics. We don't think about, we, we kind of have a hand wave number, I forget what it is, maybe someone can tell me, of a planning factor for non-battle um, casualties, right? I always forget what that number is, but we have kind of a general, like, uh, this is... Colonel Hume has it. I All right. About 10%? So let me give you some numbers here. In World War II, as the U.S. entered cities in North Africa, we helped exacerbate a low-level already existing hepatitis epidemic. We saw 17% hospitalization of U.S. personnel in North Africa from hepatitis alone. So that blows out that number, right? You're already 7% higher. And if you think about force loss, 17%, it's a really large chunk of change for your forces. Now, we learned from this, and we learned also we had near 10% from typhus or somewhere in there. There's a debate about whether it was 6 or 10, whatever, from typhus in Middle East. And so we learned from this, and as we got ready for the liberation of Italy, we anticipated that the attack on Naples would cause a typhus epidemic. Would cause the low-level typhus problem that was already going on in Naples, it would cause an epidemic. We were right. And so when we hit Naples, we've already had a national uh, military unit set up to help prevent the typhus epidemic, and it's ready to go in as soon as we hit Naples. It is equipped with really tonnage of DDT, and it starts sh every U.S. soldier, every time they come in contact with local population, has to be showered in DDT. And then we start doing mass showering of the population in DDT, which obviously creates some knock-on effects, like later in life. There's some really weird pictures of babies taking DDT baths and things like that, courtesy of Uncle Sam. And it was actually inter-allied. We worked really closely with the British on that because it was more DDT resources than we could provide and more medics than we could provide. But the effect of this is really critical. When we get to the city, we try to preserve the U.S. force from it by declaring the entire city off-limits to U.S. U.S. forces. What's the problem with that if you're fighting through a city? You have to go into the city. You're in the city, and yet I'm declaring it off limits to my forces for the epidemic. So that didn't really work so well. Within the first week of liberation, the measured number of, cash of deaths from typhus is at 250 per week. It's actually higher than that, but we don't know how many, but that's who's in hospitalization. By within two weeks, it's up to 700 per week and is expected exponential growth. And it is now, at that point, becomes considered a major threat to the entire U.S. offensive in Italy, i.e. threatening to shut down the Allied offensive in Italy until we can get a hold of it. Again, the DDT helps. Yeah. Did the Germans have this policy? The Germans were who brought it. Um, yes. So yes, the Germans brought it because German units did duty in concentration camps. And so the, the units circulating from the east into Italy brought it actually from the concentration and death camps into Italy. Um, and it's going to become a very big problem in the German army in the Eastern Front, for instance. You've got lots of people dying from typhus, so. Yeah, I'm so glad we <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Separate question. So I'm assuming this list is not all inclusive. This list is not all inclusive. Within that said, what differentiates than not providing, becoming a city manager? So like I'm, I'm also, I'm assuming providing electricity because people can't do that. So I would actually say it is not, so, um, the answer is you need to become a city manager, to be honest. So we need to create a task force in itself. To manage the phase four considerations as, you, as you're doing phase three, yeah. Okay. Because otherwise this will get ahead of you because of this last big point here. No US division has sufficient organic capabilities to provide for a major urban area and retain sufficient combat power for further operations. That just does not exist in our structure. 
So that becomes a planning imperative and task force by itself. If you don't have an OPT looking at how are we doing phase four as we're doing phase three, you're already behind the curve. You're already missing the boat. Who are the experts to reach out to internal to the U.S. Department? Civil Affairs. And it's what they do. Yeah. Now, fun story is this is actually how Henry Kissinger got us started in politics. Is in Germany, as part of the occupation of Germany, we did do this. And we take Henry Kissinger because he speaks fluent German and we give him a small town. And he does quite well on a small town, so we give him a bigger city. He does quite well on a bigger city running it. And then we give him an entire uh, state of Germany and he does fairly well on that. And then he becomes Henry Kissinger. Um, but that's really where he got us started as being Henry Kissinger because we had done deliberate planning for this from before we ever set foot on France of how we're going to handle this. Um, and obviously there's counter intel part aspects of this and all. What do you think that would then see handle that then? So I would say for all of this, it is the echelon that is responsible for the urban environment. So if you have a smaller urban center and it's a brigade who is responsible for it, then the brigade needs to make sure somebody's thinking about this. Either owes it to the division to say, hey, resource us for that, or has to figure out if, you know, if it's a very small built up environment, say Rajesh size, Brigade should be handled, start to being able to handle this and at least make the necessary request. Again, if no U.S. division has this thing, so whose division going to lean on? They're going to lean on core and theater, which means these are RFIs and requests for support and enablers that have to go up early in the planning process, which is why I take your point exactly. You need to start OPTing this out as soon as you start to look at a possible warno for dealing with a urban environment. It just has to be an OPT priority. Yeah. So there was some good practice in the Mosul operation in terms of the coordination uh, in 2016 in the shaping phase for this particular phase. Uh, and again, because the phase was happening as areas being taken, you know, you were trying to move to phase three and phase four, and even training of uh, security forces and public order management, displacement, medical needs, etc. Uh, and there was there was just a lot of really uh, important. Uh, coordination that took place between the coalition, Iraqi government, Iraqi NGOs, uh, the human agency. There were gaps, but uh, it was a good example of that kind of uh, coordination um, and thinking through how quickly uh, this support uh, was needed before the entire liberation of Muslims. Right. And what I'm not going to say is how you do this coordination. This is more to say this is a planning consideration that needs to be up front rather than this is the exact NGO you call on. And, you know, this is how you're going to solve this. I firmly believe each one is going to be different because of the different presences of NGO, different capabilities of different divisions. But it must be part of deliberate planning. And we'll come back to that idea that this is also your first phase of preparing for the defense if you have to transfer. But with that... Let's go on and talk about the offense a little bit because we're the American military. We are the, you know, we're offensive. It's the most fun, right? You get to roll tanks and maneuver strikers and all kinds of good things. Um, but we've been talking a lot for the last few days that it's also really challenging in an urban environment. So how do we approach this? How do we draw up operational approaches that are not just sitting and looking at maps and being like, I want a line to go here and, you know, there's stuff in the way, but yeah, Joe can figure that one out. So, because I am a SAMS guy, I had to put like some doctrine on here or I'll lose like my entire SAMS credibility and credentials if they won't let me back in the building. Here are your, if you go to elements of the operational art, this is really the considerations that are going to help you choose which operational approach to take. Obviously, under the, the concept of elements of operational art, all are relevant, but these are the ones to really look at. End state and conditions. What are you trying to do with this city? Why are you here? Are you just trying to take an S pod and an A pod and you don't really care about the rest of the city? Are you trying to open a road for onward movement and you don't care? Are you trying to take a capital building or a significant uh, terrain? Right? Why are you, what is your end state and what are the conditions that determine that you have met that end state? Secondly, phasing and transitions. Right? We, this is not just phase lines. This is as we've talked about this phase three, phase four stuff, right? This is getting really complicated, right? This is also talking about moving on and handing over to follow on forces. This is also forward passage of lines when you need someone else to move forward, which is directly hit to culmination. 
how long can you sustain the type of fight you're in? What can you do to extend that timeline? Tempo, not only how fast do you need to go to hit your end state, right? Is there a level of speed you need to go? But tempo is always not just speed. Sometimes you want to do, and we'll see in some of these options, a deliberately slower tempo to be able to better attrit your adversary. Right, so how are you controlling tempo? And finally, very critically, as we've talked a number of times already about logistics and sustainment, your operational reach. How can you extend that operational reach into the urban area? So these have these in the back of your head as we're going to talk the rest of this about operational approaches. How does it line up across these variables? So let's talk about the first potential operational approach. Destroying the city always comes up whenever we discuss urban operations. And I am sure there is someone who has secretly been sinking in the back of their head. This is all really complicated. Can't we just reduce it to sand and dust? Right. We've got a lot of explosives in our arsenal and we can do uh, arms reduction one at a time on an urban area until it no longer is a problem. And you know what? We've done that before. It's not something the U.S. military has not done. In the last big list go, uh, we did that to Cologne. We did that to Tokyo, right? And in the case I'm going to use, we did that to Le Havre in France. So why Le Havre? And that's a picture of what's left of the city after we take care of it. Fairly large city, that's what's left. So why do we do this to it? It is a critical port on the English Channel We've been trying to take Brest in the Brittany Peninsula for quite a while, and the Germans had fortified it so much that it's going to take us most of the rest of the European campaign to actually take it. What this means is we can't use its harbor, which is what we need, and so we're stuck using the temporary harbors in Normandy. So rather than give the Germans the time to really fortify it and us to have to clear it street to street, we decide to reduce the city. We destroy 15,000 buildings. And it is a relatively easy win. We do just roll into it. Now, got a problem, though, because with all that destruction, it takes us over a month to even begin limited port services. We basically reduced the port out of functionality for what we had been trying to take it for. And civilian casualties are so high that it actually turned some of the pro-liberation French against us because we did just kind of wipe out a city little bit of an issue there, especially for the people living in that area. They were not happy. Um, and so we have to think about the considerations. It achieves decisive effects, right? You have destroyed the enemy force in that city. They are no longer there if all that is left is sand dunes. It saves time. You could do this fast, especially with our joint fires capabilities. And it saves friendly casualties because you're reducing it with joint fires. The, however, we have to think about civilian tendencies under bombardment. What are they going to do? Are they going to stay in place and die? Are they going to try to flee to your lines? How are the civilian possibilities going to go? You also have an issue with moral injury. And we saw this in the battle in the attack on Cologne and the attack on Tokyo, where you have things that we now identify as moral injury. People who took part in those battles on our side who become combat ineffective due to the trauma of doing things that they felt were simply not compatible with themselves as moral humans. So we have to think about that consideration to it. Also, the long-term effects of the civilian casualties. If we're wiping out a city, what does that do to us? What does that do to the local economy? What does that do to the local civilian population? It creates other problems such as disease. You've got a lot of bodies. You've got a lot of other issues. You've destroyed critical infrastructure nodes, so disease is going to be a major issue. And frankly, there's the law of armed conflict considerations, there's the ethical considerations, and there are the moral considerations, which may render this, and hopefully does, uh, unusable for most people in this room. But it is worth understanding why an adversary may choose it, right? What are the pros and cons of it for an adversary who may not care about some of those considerations? So let's talk about assaulting the city in all its many and varied wonderful forms. Right? If we're not going to destroy it, now we actually have to deal with it. So the first case of assault we could talk about is a deliberate assault. This is pretty much what we're used to seeing. It's what they described at Rajesh. 
It's like the go to, I am feeling uncreative today version of taking a city. It starts with a breach, usually establishing a foothold, then a maneuver phase where you're trying to move through the city, and then an exploitation phase where you move beyond your objectives and try to break out to the next phase lines and beyond, right? We can all kind of picture this straight up doctrine all good. We've got some great historical cases of it. Obviously, I think the most famous is Stalingrad from the German perspective. It's exactly the plan of Stalingrad. Breach, maneuver, and then move beyond Stalingrad into an exploitation phase. So what are some advantages of it? Well, it allows for consolidation. You breach, you establish your foothold, you consolidate your forces, you can affect another breach if you need, or you can move into maneuver and exploitation. It allows for continuous and decisive operations. There's no reason once you begin operations to pause operations, so you can retain initiative. It is a decisive. It allows for you to actually defeat and attract the enemy to the point where they even go to that doctrinal weird spot of destroy, right, because of the deliberate... Uh, pay for it, and it allows exploitation. If you break through very well, if you win the maneuver phase, you can continue to move on beyond the urban area to what other subsequent objectives exist in the campaign. Disadvantages, it is force intensive, right? We've talked about this a lot. It requires a lot of resources to do if we're talking a large city against an equal or larger size enemy. It can be very slow. So I've said it can be fast. It can also be slow. I, if you have to do repeated breaches, if your maneuver fails, you run into Stalingrad over and over and over again. That kind of sucks. Um, ask the German army. Um, it can devolve into multiple unlinked fights. If you transition to that maneuver phase, too quickly, you can find your forces isolated throughout the city as the enemy, as the breach was too narrow, or the enemy is able to reseal that. It risks creating gravitational pull as you have to commit more and more forces to support the fight inside the city, and it can pull from other fights that you're having in the more rural areas. It also has risked rapid culmination. You pour a lot of stuff into the breach, and it doesn't work. You've just culminated, game over. You've got to reconstitute. So, not the best thing there. And uh, if you are fighting through the city, as we've discussed over and over again, it has the potential for very high civilian casualties because you are fighting through exactly where they live. So let's move on to a variation of this. In a lot of ways, urban terrain, from a purely operational and tactical perspective, is not significantly different from complex, multi-layered defenses and depths. And so this chap here, um, General Montgomery, came up with an idea that he called Colossal Cracks, which is just a really good, memorable name. It's alliteration. It sounds slightly dirty. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, he would be shocked to find it sounds quite dirty, and that's probably an issue with Montgomery, um, man who didn't drink coffee. Um, but what you do, basically, is you build combat power very visibly. You let the enemy build up combat power to match your build. You do not try to mask where the breach is coming and where the assault is coming. But you build overwhelming combat power. You concentrate all available force on the area you're going to do the breach, and you do as much damage to the enemy as possible. Having done this, what changes this from deliberate assault is you don't move into a maneuver or exploitation phase. You hit them with a colossal crack, and then you pause. You reconstitute your force, you build it up again, and you rinse and you repeat until the enemy breaks. Because eventually you will attrit them to the point that they can no longer fight. So this is not a running battle. This is breach, pause, build up combat power, breach, pause, build up combat power. And the goal with these is to have the enemy defend with its mass against you until you successfully attrit them to the point that they cannot continue the fight. So this is a variation on deliberate assault. So what are its advantages? It reduces the chance of dissipation of effort or overextension, right? You're keeping your whole force together. You are not allowing them to dissipate. It allows for decisive victory. If you keep doing this, eventually the enemy is just dead. Then you've won. And the city or whatever else you want is yours. It retains control of the initiative. You set the tempo. It is a deliberate tempo. 
You set the starts and endpoints of each effort based on conditions or terrain to retain maximum efficacy. It's not effects based. It is terrain based based on your understanding of your operational reach. So you just keep your force together as much as possible. It also allows from, for the trans transition to exploitation and maneuver. Once the enemy is dead, you maneuver wherever you want, and they can do very little to stop you. One advantage it has to think about it is it is heavily joint fires enabled, right? This is the artilleryman's dream fight because what's really doing it it's artillery and engineers and everyone's going a little bit and what sets the tempo is your firepower it is a firepower based approach but its disadvantage is it results in repeated breaches and therefore very engineer and heavy and fire centric if you don't have sufficient fires if you don't have sufficient engineering engineer capabilities to repeatedly do assault breaches this is not the choice for you it is potentially slow the enemy determines when you're done this by when they're all dead or running away right it has the potential for overextension if you think you have defeated the enemy and you haven't that gets you back into that Stalingrad like affair and it gives the enemy an opportunity to prepare for a deliberate defense why because you're showing them exactly where you want to, are going to go you want them to prepare that deliberate defense right in front of you because you want to kill them all in their defense and obviously in a city this amount of joint fires creates a huge possibility for civilian casualties which is another consideration to bring to bear on it go to another one this is john spencer's favorite in fact, he gave it the name. Um, we were talking about like this idea, and he's like, oh, this is raising the flag. Because he had called it raising the flag before, and it was a great meeting of minds to talk about what this was. So credit to John Spencer for the name. So in the raising the flag style of operation, what you really are going to do is you're going to breach rapidly into the key terrain. So if we can kind of picture Rajesh in our head, they said everyone breaches, establishes a foothold, kind of reconstitutes, and then moves on to try to get to that traffic circle on these big buildings. In this case, what you do is you kind of rush it. You breach and then flow forward to key terrain or a city center. Now, you're not really about guarding your lines of communication in this case. What you're going to do is you're going to go to the significant terrain where the enemy has to dislodge you either for strategic or cultural reasons. You're going to assume the defense, and you're going to let them try to dislodge you, at which point you're going to attrit them. Um, a really good example of this, there are three. Some of them go well, some of them go poorly. So Second Fallujah, this was the deliberate approach of Second Fallujah. In Lebanon, Ainata, or Ainata, this didn't go as well, kind of works. Um, and in the Battle of Janine in 2002, they do inadvertently do this. Their goal is to penetrate to the center of this, uh, what's called the refugee camp, um, or the kind of very dense part of the city, and the enemy will attack them, and then that will push the enemy into a waiting line of attack. Um, it doesn't really work very well in that case, because you need sufficient capabilities with you to maintain that defense. You need to attract them on the defense. So it's breach, flow, take key terrain and force them to attack you. And this way you get any defensive advantages of the urban terrain are now working for you. And they're going into a hasty counterattack in a place they didn't expect. So when I, and Rajesh yesterday, I asked them, hey, do you have anyone do this? How would you counterattack given that you have very few forces? And they go, no, really, we've got this pacing where everyone goes and establishes a foothold so we can fall back to a secondary line of defense and then use our strong points and hold them there. This denies the enemy that ability. But it does have some problems, right? It requires a lot of support and enabling from outside the urban terrain. You're not going to flow into this key objective with all of your fires capability. You have to be able to coordinate that from outside the area you're fighting. It places your line of communication and casual Kazavak at risk. If you think of it, this as a lollipop, that like lollipop stem is quite vulnerable at that point. And lastly, it risks isolation, right? You've gone, you've raised the flag in the center, and now what are you? You're isolated. Yeah. Question for that. Um, if it's, a, it's a good terrain or this is terrain, wouldn't that be also a place where the enemy 
plans to mass courses quickly? Often not, because they're expecting you to do a breach and follow, right? You, we have a way we fight. This is taking advantage of they're probably going to try to meet us at the breach. And then they're going to have phase lines of defense, like a defense in depth. What this really does is it cuts the ability of the enemy to do a defense in depth. Because while they're planning to fall back under certain conditions, you're just rolling through. Yeah, John, did you want to add on that? That was the second battle of Lugia. The, the key train that they chose to punch to would go on part, but they thought the enemy would think that this, their secondary fighting position. So they actually moved into enemy fighting positions and then used fires to secure the lines and to defeat the enemy in detail. The enemy had to come out. And that's really the purpose of this one. Obviously, if your enemy is centered on that key terrain and already mass there, don't choose this choice, right? And that's it, is all of these are condition-based choices. You have to look at the operational environment. You have to do your IPB. You have to do your reverse IPB. And all of this will start to drive which of these choices you take. What echelon do you see this at the lowest? I have literally seen a company attack do this. So this is translatable down, but it depends on, again, what's the nature of the enemy you're fighting and what kind of support you have and need. You can even do like further than that, the US Army Rangers in Afghanistan used this, they called the, the Team Merrill concept. Um, they couldn't find the Taliban, so they just went in, took over a compound at the team level, raised the American flag over uh, an enemy held village and forced the enemy to come and try and get them out of it. And then they just, you know, sort of spent the night before comparing positions which laid waste to anybody who moved mm. with ISR, AC-130s, all that sort of stuff saying. Um, yeah, you, you can do this at any, any echelon room. Um, it, it's very happy to be the caveats of you can understand your enemy's capabilities, that's an incredible thing. You don't know where the enemy is, and you want to force them out wherever you, they're trying to hide. One thing to consider is no matter what echelon, this really complicates Kasavak. Kasavak becomes really can become really, really challenging using this method, especially if you do, if you don't have unfettered access to the sky. I'm not even saying you don't own the sky if they have lots of A two A D or amp man pads. This can really complicate Kasavak. So that is a consideration. If you're choosing this, you need to spend a lot of time with your medical planners figuring out how people are going to stay alive. Yeah. One more question, Colonel Spencer. In the second battle of the Lugia, um, did they, the enemy, have a reserve that they used, or did they not plan for that? No, so they were planning a Chechen small group mobile defense. Yeah. Um, from they, they shot for a few houses, right, house from hell, things like that. But they, they were planning on a secure foothold and start clearing. So they prepared multiple houses to be that in a mobile anti armor defense. And they still took out six tanks and then the mobility kills on that penetration. Yeah. I'm looking at the previous presenter who uh, is going to be going to NTC or a couple presenters, our morning presenter is going to be going to NTC for rotation soon. I would love to see someone do this at Rajesh, like just to try it out because Black Horse is so sure on how you're going to operate in, as they told us. I'd love to see this tried and just a see what happens moment. Not guarantee it will work, just to see what happens moment. Um, yeah, you need tanks in the city for this. Could you potentially do like a mixture of the colossal crack and raising the flag? Yeah, I suppose, I suppose you could, but you lose a little bit of the joy of both of them, right? Colossal crack is really building up combat power and is really fire based. With this one, the goal is speed. Colossal crack is not speed because, for instance, as was brought up, if the NMV develops a significant operational reserve in a second line of defenses, this is going to have a lot more trouble. So you really need to get them to think you're going to do this through the standard American thing. What this does allow for is a lot of good deception, right? You could see you could do a deception operation, which looks like you're building up for this massive full breach, and in fact, it's a narrow penetration and move. So those are kind of more of the considerations. Yeah. There's also the intangible effect of the morale of raising that flag the third day, one day, two day, three day, the approach of the back to your Jeep out of a 35, 40 day slot, the flag was up on day three. So it gave everyone, a, not just a rally point, but I would mention that if there are civilians that are neutral, or fairly maybe kind of neutral, they might be more inclined to say, wow, the Americans really are here, wow, that 
that company's really here and there's a flag. Yeah, that's absolutely the morale and psychological effects of this. Also, seeing enemy tanks roll by your defensive position and realize the enemy is behind you probably has a psychological effect too. So I'm going to move on to another form of very deliberate assault. This also comes from the First World War. It's one of my absolute favorites. Um, it's called Bite and Hold. It was pioneered by the British after a number of very bad operations, um, including the Battle of Somme, or the first part of the Battle of Somme. And the idea of this is it's really deliberate tempo. And this is why I wanted to remind you, frequently planners think tempo is speed. Tempo is not speed. Tempo is the pacing and rhythm of operations. And so bite and hold is an incredibly deliberate um, tempo. Now, when we talk about it, it's again with the idea that this problem of urban space has significant similarity to the problem of complex defenses in depths. That taking the first line of enemy defense rarely wins the day for you and may invite actually a more deadly counterattack than you had in the breach. In the First World War, the British and French and their many, many allies the world around, um, looking at our Australians here, um, faced a really significant problem, which is, a, it's a myth, right? They went over the top and all got shot down in no man's land. That's not really what happened. What really happened is most of the time they got over the top, got into the enemy's trench, seized the first line or two lines of the enemy's trench, and then because the enemy knew exactly where they were because they were in their previous positions, the Germans were able to target incredibly effective artillery on their former positions. And at this point, the British and French supply lines were extended. The were exhausted, and they almost always were killed in the immediately following counterattack. So, how do you deal with this problem? Bite and hold comes as an approach to deal with this problem. You mass overwhelmingly force in a very limited area. You are not trying to take a lot. You consciously limit gains to easily digestible. So this is a logistics and sustainment driven approach. So what you do if you're doing this approach is you talk to your planners from your logistics side and say, hey, how much area can I digest? How far can I make sure I have logistic overmatch as we move forward? And what you do is you pull resources to that. You move forward, you breach. And then you switch to the defensive almost immediately thereafter. So you take an area, switch to the defensive, build your defense, and then breach elsewhere. So it is not colossal cracks where you're building everything in one area and continuing to cycle for the enemy. Here, deception matters. You actually want your breach to be as painless as possible. You then move on to the defensive and invite the enemy to try to assault once you have created that deliberate defense. And then at a time of your choosing, you launch another small scale offensive somewhere else in the environment. And eventually what you're doing is you're combining these bites to shape the enemy position to a point where that enemy position becomes untenable. So you're bending and bending until they create a pocket or you're pinching off a pocket or you're expanding your foothold on the terrain. However, you're choosing where those bites goes in. The purpose of the bites is to shape the enemy over time and keep a decisive advantage at every breach and then transfer to the defense. So you don't have the problem of overreach. So what are its advantages? It allows the attacking echelon to retain combat power and concentrate it because you are not overextending. You are driven in your approach by when you, uh, your ability to reconstitute forces and to supply them. It allows massing of effect on the decisive point, the decisive point in this case being the breach each time. It keeps initiative with the attacker. You're choosing where and when to begin that assault and the, your adversary must react to that or they can see the terrain, which is exactly what you want, right? Great, they've given up this place that I want to take and take to the defensive, awesome. Now I'm even stronger in the defensive and it can change the advantage of defensive oriented terrain. So if you have terrain that favors the defense, this allows you to take it and change it. Now, disadvantages, it absolutely sacrifices speed. This is a slow and deliberate approach. It also limits gains. 
right? You are not, let's say your force does take an area that you've planned and they take it on a post. Our natural inclination in the US Army would just be say, hey, go freaking exploit. The enemy is not in front of you, get into their rear area, get into their depths, and just own it. As a commander who is commanding bite and hold style approach, you say, no, do not go further than the plan because the plan is a sustainment focused plan. So stop where I told you to stop and switch to the defense. If you did that without casualties, great, even better. If the enemy wasn't there, even better, that's fine, but stop, do not switch phases. And it is a non-decisive operation. There is no point in this operation where you're like, I have decisively defeated the enemy. You're leaving the enemy to withdraw or to attack you while you're on the defense. So this is a non-decisive operation. It is considered, you could see it as permanently shaping, constantly shaping and shaping and shaping and shaping to victory. So planning considerations, how do you maintain tempo assist? How do you maintain that deliberate tempo? Phasing and transitions, you have two questions. You have three parts of phasing and transitions of this. One, the switch to the defense. Two, when do you begin your next assault? And three, when have you shaped the enemy enough that you can stop doing bite and hold and freaking go after them? Right, when do you get to the fun part? Do you see this as maybe a uh, approach for our current tactical exercise based off the size of the objective and the size of our forces? This is certainly a valid approach. You'd have to RFI, for instance, how much time the boss is giving you to take the objectives, right? Because this is not a fast pace of operation. This is deliberately keeping your operation slow. And contrary to doctrine, right? Doctrine says we want to avoid the attritional approach. This is fundamentally an attritional approach. This is not a maneuver-based approach. So it's a little bit alien to our current doctrine, which means there may be some bosses who are highly uncomfortable with that. I'm going to finish up offense and then we'll take a little bit of a bio break. So I'm going to get into some wackier and some of the more wild country uh, forms of offensive approach now. This one is called nonlinear assault. It is often confused with walking through walls or mouse holing, which is tactical. And some people also call it fractal operations. The reason it was confused is because there was an Israeli author, author who, for our sins, worked at Sam's for with Sam's for a few years, who managed to confuse the two deliberately and take an operational approach and a tactical approach, kind of mess them together and from this day forward, we're all confused. Um, but what it really says is you create mixed combat teams or bubbles which have no fixed movement and phases towards objectives. You give them an overall objective, but you don't coordinate phase lines. You don't coordinate how they move to the objective. Obviously, we're all starting to get itchy. I can see people being like, oh, that's, that's really uncomfortable, right? Because <laughs> what am I actually telling them? Um, these task organized bubbles are really important. And what it means is coordination is non-hierarchical. So these bubbles aren't reaching back to div, div and say, hey, I'm moving here, I'm moving there. They're doing lateral coordination with each other. Um, so they're shortening that coordination line. And the argument is, as division or core, you're not going to have enough fidelity onto what's going on, on the ground to be particularly useful anyway, right, in this really hyper-dense urban terrain. So just don't. Take yourself out of the way and let your subordinate commanders who know what they're doing, who know the conditions on the ground, actually do their job. Um, which is a very, very uncomfortable thing to say. Um, and we can all think about some of the problems with it. But what it does is it sacrifices coordination for maintenance of initiative. So therefore, if one bubble is stopped, if they run into a strong point that they can't get around, that is no loss. It is not messing up your timing. It's not messing up your phasing. You throw support behind the bubble that's moving. <laughs> so if you have a bubble that's enjoying success, that bubble becomes the main effort until they stop enjoying success. And then the next bubble becomes the main effort that is enjoying success. So it keeps switching who the main effort is and who resources are thrown behind. It creates confusion among the enemy, frankly. I mean, it can create confusion among your own force too, which is one of the negatives, but it can cre it create significant confusion of the enemy. It essentially says, I don't have a main effort. So where are you going mass? Oh, you're going mass here? It's Great, we're over here now. 
That's my main effort because your math's there, right? So it's objective based, it's not enemy focused. Now, downside is it can result in multiple isolated battles, right? Each bubble is essentially find, fighting its own campaign, its own battle, and it can result in your bubbles being isolated. And in the Israeli context, we have two cases where this happened, one where it went, worked very successfully. That's that bottom case here, which is the Battle of Nablus in 2002 worked very, very effectively. And you have the case of the Battle of Janine, which I've mentioned before, where it worked very, very poorly. So, can go either way. It's really, again, about the conditions that support it. it yeah. Really, sorry. sorry. Uh, let's go there and then there. Yeah. Is this really relevant, though, to like a larger force? This seems more like a guerrilla warfare. So both of these were division-level operations. So, so my second question is that the supply, the supply issue then, so if you have non-linear situations happening, then how, do you, how are you planning for sustaining like, the operation? So it is very difficult from the sustainment perspective. That is one of the challenges with it. Yeah. I'm not going to say like there's an easy answer of how you sustain it, but it's basically pull-driven sustainment rather than push-driven sustainment. So the bubbles basically say, hey, we're starting to run low on this, and you... And so it's pull rather than push sustainment. That's our doctrine. Yeah. That's the U.S. doctrine for all sustainment. So, fair enough. Yeah, but how do you get it to them across the no man's lands? That bubble's got to come back and connect somehow. Right. And so that's where division level forces come. They provide the route security to get the sustainment in. That becomes a lot of what division is actually doing, is providing that sustainment and the security to the sustainment. And one of the things, when it doesn't work in Janine, that's a key reason why, is they cannot actually provide the res the forces to get them, and why it works in Nablus is because they can. And there may be another reason is that the and and where it worked, those were paratroopers. That was a division of paratroopers, right? Well, yes, but that's not actually a determining factor in this. Um, so it's a paratrooper unit, but it's also mixed with some reserve formations and some armored units. In Janine, it's some reserve formations, Golani, which is heavy infantry brigade, and um, also some armor and also some sp soft units. So this is often used as a form of analysis, uh, either paratroopers, either reservists. It's a little bit more complicated than that, and it has also a lot to do with the enemy they're facing. And frankly, I would say the quality of the commanders involved in both of these. That, like, just to think about different units, right? Parents yeah. Are used to being isolated and fighting like that. Right? So Famous quote. in the Israeli military, that's not the case. Paratroopers really don't train to do that. <laughs> they do five jumps and call themselves paratroopers. And all five jumps are the same day. Uh, I mean, you have to agree that it's a higher, well, a higher standard of joining the unit. Golani and paratroopers have the same joining standard. So they're actually... Again, different military systems work significantly differently. Golani and paratroopers are the two rival of like, we are the elite of the infantry at this period. So I saw one, two, three, so yeah. So it's also our philosophy, close to our philosophy, and how we do sustainment is, it's, for us, it's not the bubble just moving along, but there's always a unit behind that. So road security is provided that way. But the last few days, my impression was the U.S. approach very coordination and synchronization heavy. Is there a way to fit this into this approach? I think it would be very, very, honestly, I think it would be very, very hard for a U.S. division to execute this approach. I think it would require a lot of pre-planned, but this is why this is going to planners, right? Is because if you decide you want this approach, this is something you really need to start planning, socializing, communicating way before the operation. You need to decide how big your bubbles are, who's on the, who's on the keeping the opening, reopening the routes to them. You need to get those commanders socialized to the idea that division isn't going to be helping you a whole lot. There is just a whole lot that need, would need to go into this to make this an effective U.S. approach. Yeah. So that's a good, uh, what I was going to ask is, uh, for us as planners, not as the commanders, General, if, if you're the commander and I'm your your G5 or your G3 and I tell you, all right, here's here's my concept, sir. We're going to give everything to our brigades. We're not going to keep anything for ourselves, and we're not going to give them any objectives. You're probably going to kick me out of the office. So they have an overall objective, just, it's like super mission command, but yeah. But I'm just going to sit there and watch. <laughs> 
It's basically, if yeah. I talk, I'm not going to control the shit. I'm going to watch it on CNN. And I'm going to watch it go. Here right. you're, you're going to be your right. Right. And so the yes, I put in my you know in my uh, any of the pros and cons of my con is way outside of the commander's comfort zone. Yeah. And I got her like way like twice. But but again, but I bear my. <laughs> so, uh, so I guess my question though is, you as a commander, like, how could I, how could I sell that to you? It would have to make the most sense. So you know, there, there, there's way. You, no. I, I, again, I consider myself a fairly open-minded guy, but just like, okay, so just, just real quick, right? Are you really going to get killed in Rajesh, Scott? Are you really going to get killed in Rajesh in three weeks? Uh, if I try to the no, no, no. Are you really going to die? Are you really worried about losing your life? Definitely. Okay, you're not. But your OER is kind of on the line. <laughs> are you going to try some crazy shit? Yes, I'll probably make a little safer. Right. So, and that's just his paper, right? And I'm talking about soldiers, right? So I'm doing this for real. I'm talking about soldiers. So you're going to have to convince me why this crazy idea makes so much sense. So is it achievable? Yes. Depends on how much your your guy's doing, right? So it's a valid question. I don't want to deal too much yep. on it. But you guys are right that some of these, and I was looking at this last time, going, oh, this is great. And then I kind of did some research since yeah. the last time, like, there's some problems here. Significant ones. Yeah, I saw two hands in the back. So I was just going to follow on and say, but this is about risk. And to your point, sir, this is about being able to convince you that the risk is worth the reward. The people who do this really well, General Taylor mentioned yesterday, he tells the off four commander way down there what he wants them to achieve, and off four at the low level can go out and do this with like small groups of geezers that get behind, in and around, and make things. Small groups of what? Geezers. Sir, thank you. <laughs> What's a geezer? It's like old people. Determined men. Okay, small band of determined men. That's even better than the electronic and a small band of determined men. Does that make a good actor? Um, so, just as, you know, the different people lead different ways. My boss's boss, General, uh, General Baldwin, when we, were, when we were out running around, he was leading by text, right? He had a text train with about 20 of his subordinate commanders, two or three levels down, and he was on a phone with commanders, right? He had, to say it was flat, it was amazing, right? And keeping up with it. And there were a host of problems that went, none of these solutions are the magic button, right? So it's, hey, does this work for the particular thing? And are you willing to take this risk? And that's the piece right there, right? You have to convince me that the risk is worth the reward with me. Now, anybody who's ever worked with me, I say, there is no reward without risk. That's one of my sayings. So it's a question of the risk, right? Great. And that's something... This is almost what we're talking about when we're fighting on multiple levels. I mean, granted, we're, we're like taking this back down into the tactical, yep. uh, your point about it being at the operational level. But you want a non-hierarchical, you want a flat communication, like everyone on the same net, and really short, sharp bursts of transmissions so that everyone's not stepping over everyone else. Right. And they're able to just work to the intent, go. Right. So, and so just to, take, yep. to, to, to your point, if you were going to sell me on this, what it would probably look like is you would take all the division assets, all the brigade assets, run them all the way down to those battalion commanders, and I would be kind of following along on Twitter with nine battalion commanders running around doing crazy stuff. You would be there, sir. It only works when you are there at your main main effort brigade. And so in this, so that's one of the differences with the German approach and this approach is this one the commander isn't with them because there is no main effort brigade. The main effort brigade changes. I'm a little bit conscious of time and need of bio break. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to retain questions or comments until we're on break. And I will stand right here during the break to follow on on this because I do want to finish. And we also have question time at the end to circle back unless this is like really critical on this. Yeah. Just saying that you should well, not necessarily have to convince the commander. It's not that you know, first in six hours. In, in the core headquarters, we have a, and you probably have the same uh, operational analysis research branch who are, who are there that you know, scientists with or analysts with the data. So actually, uh, you know, in, in this, we call them more in, in, in this approach, you could lose this, this many people. The problem is with a really, with an approach like this, we don't have a lot of data to base it on. So I work with some quant people, and they will tell you. 
it's too small n to be able to come up with anything useful for the commander. I want to finish the assault versions before we hit break, and we're getting pretty late in this, so I really want to take to the next form of assault. This is why we put you last yep. day, Jacob, is we got all night. Uh, excellent. As long as I have water and caffeine, we're good to go. Um, so I want to talk about infiltrate a little bit, um, which is another option, right? You can infiltrate the city rather than assaulting it deliberately. And there are a couple of different approaches to do this historically. So I actually added one recently, which is Shusha, which is using overland special operations to, or ranger elements or whatever you've got that can really go quite quietly over a large amount of terrain to infiltrate the city from an unexpected direction. A more classic version of this is, say, Arnhem with the British paratroopers, right? You're, how are you getting around all of those defenses? Dropping in. Their goal wasn't to control the whole city. It was to control key movement corridors through it. So their goal was not to do a deliberate breach of the city, not to take the city, but rather to come in as quietly as possible into the city and then secure the key terrain. Not necessarily the most favorable example in terms of outcome, um, but that's neither here nor there um, for this purpose. Um, but you can see other examples of working with insurgents in the case of Marseille or Paris. Um, which we'll come back to actually the case of Paris, where you have a simultaneously in Marseille, you have special operations units operating in the city that have infiltrated in together with irregular forces and insurgents, and they time their fight for an assault on the city from the outside. So it creates a both in and out kind of approach. You have Hue City, of which the general is quite happy to talk about at length to anyone who wants to hear, and is far more expert than in fact I am. And... You have Paris where it goes the other way. The uprising actually starts and it forces the conventional forces to get involved, which they didn't really want to do. So what are your planning considerations for this one? One, it's dependent on that the enemy has weak internal security, right, in the urban area. If they have strong internal security, you're, this is putting in smaller forces, smaller teams into the city. So they're all rolled up pretty quickly. Well, then you've just lost your ability to do this. This is just over. Or if you're moving a bunch of kind of soft bubbles over land, they're trying to infiltrate in and the enemy sees them and drops like a tank battalion on them. This is all also over, right? So this does depend on blindness on the enemy. The other thing is you can't just wake up one morning and to decide to do this. You can't be a division or a corps approaching a city and goes, you know what I really think we should do? I think we, I think we should absolutely have soft do some stuff in it and do soft things and suddenly it will go well. The establishment of networks to enable this has to begin at times years ahead of the actual operation. Certainly months, but likely years ahead if you're using internally based networks. So this is not something you can do just overnight. It also is soft heavy in most versions of this, right? Short of the airborne or air assault into the city by surprise, an air assault kind of gives up the gig. You know, you've got a bunch of helicopters coming. It's not quite stealthy and infiltrating. Um, but, right, you need a lot of soft, which means you're going to be requesting assets that are not organic to your core division, which obviously puts this early into the planning process. So this has to be a very deliberate early choice. It also risks defeat in detail. If you're taking, say, the Marseille approach, where you're going to have your soft come in, and then you're going to have your insurgency start, and then you're going to have your conventional forces enter, what you can easily find is your soft dead, then your insurgency is dead, and then your conventional forces have to pick another approach, or they're going to try to assault the city and they're going, going to die. Um, an example of that is the Battle of Amman in the First World War, where Lawrence of Arabia shows that he is not actually the commander that he says he is in his book, um, but just decided to fail to show up as he was supposed to take the city by infiltration or distract the Ottoman garrison by infiltration for the east, while the Imperial Camel Corps and the Light Horse, partially Australia and New Zealand Light Horse, are going to hit it from the west. Lawrence just decides he can't be bothered to show up, and the Camel Corps is principally wiped out. So you also have to have a lot of faith in your soft assets and their willingness to be on side for this. We'll take a pause for a bio break there, because next we're going to talk about where you get into isolating the city and the different approaches that involve isolation, and then we're going to move on to defense and preparing for the defense. Right? How long? Ten minutes? Five minutes? Ten minutes. <laughs>
I mean, he's like, hey, yeah, he's great. I'm like, great. Try it on Saturday. Let's see how it works. This one test is worth a thousand expert opinions. I like to keep it in my head. It's a champagne approach because it's just bubbly. <laughs> um, this is what I'm really here for. It's doctrinal comedy. That's what I do really do for a living. Um, okay. So if we're mainly back, just because we're going to run late and I don't want you to run late into like quality. Um, I've been told the army doesn't want to glamorize drinking. So quality, non-alcoholic beverage and eating time, um, or whatever else you do on your personal time. Um, I'm happy to drive on if we're all ready. So where I want to get to the next is we've just talked about a whole bunch of versions of assault and let's be honest, none of them sound particularly great, right? They all kind of suck in some way or another way and have a lot of risk of high friendly casualties. And in each case, I'm like, oh, yeah, and here's how it's not going to work. And then you all die. Right. So other option, this all sucks. Let's not do it. And that drives you towards some form of isolate or besiege. Because what you're then doing is you're changing the calculus. You're not doing this. Well, so we'll start with the very classic just besiege it, right? Always popular throughout history. Never fails, except in many, many times it does. Um, and we can have a gazillion and a half historical examples from the ancient siege of Jericho, if any of you are more biblically inclined, though I doubt God will be taking down walls. If he does, then you definitely have an advantage, a marked advantage over the enemy. Um, you've got Leningrad, Kiev, many times of Kiev, actually not even the current one, which was in the siege, Maastricht, Ladysmith, gazillion and a half. So let's talk the advantages and disadvantages. Well, the clear advantage is you don't fight in the city. So if you really don't want to fight in urban terrain, siege is a potential way to go. It does allow for decisive victory. You're strangling the enemy. At some point, they give up or they die. Those are their choices, if you can lock it in. It has a predictable time and resource requirement you can literally look at an estimation of what supplies are in the city, what supplies you have, how long it takes someone to die of thirst, how long it takes them to die of starvation, and you can mathematically figure out almost to the day, and in the old days there were some people who were very good and could figure it out to the hour, how long your siege is going to last. So it is a predictable planning factor. It also allows neighboring efforts to continue offensive operations. While you're besieging the city, your other efforts can go do whatever else they're doing. Um, and it forces the enemy to make a choice. Once your siege is locked in, they can either attempt to relieve it, throwing forces against you, or they can let nature take its course. So it does have some distinct advantages. Disadvantages, though, really high force requirements. If you're starving people to death, they will do everything they can to not starve to death. So you have to maintain an inside-facing defensive and an outside-facing defensive as well to protect against those relief efforts. It significantly slows tempo. You're going to be sitting there. You are not moving from that position until they're all dead or surrender. Ultimately, it can create a siege mentality as well, both in your force and the adversaries. In the adversary, that means they're going to be more okay doing without. So we're dropping down to 600 calories a day. Great. At least I'm not dead yet. And maybe if I survive that little bit longer, the besieging force will be dead. And then I'll get my revenge and I'll steal their food. Um, but it can also create a siege mentality on your force, which is you have a lot of soldiers doing nothing a lot of the day. So the problem for morale, it's a problem for supply, problem for disease. And the other problem, of course, is one of law and morality, which is ultimately it relies on the denial of food and water also to the civilian population. A siege doesn't work if the military population or the adversary in the city has access to any supplies. So if you're supply allowing supplies to the civilian population, ultimately, in most cases, part of that supply will go to your adversary and prolong your siege. So ultimately, this is a civilian targeting method. And this raises all kinds of ethical, legal, and moral concerns. Yes. But in certain lands, has been used most recently, and it has not led to the starvation of the civilian population, because that is one of the dead. Uh, so, but in certain lands, it has been used, and it has not led to the starvation of the civilian population. 
mean, mostly you look at rock out. So I want to differentiate, and we'll get to those variations of encirclement to then transition to something else versus this, which is a pure siege. So these are actually two different operational templates and require different planning requirements going into them, and I will get to those. In this case, we're just talking about a pure siege. So what are your planning considerations or an adversary's planning consideration if you're doing IPB on whether they're going to be able to maintain a siege? One, do they have the force and time? Can they isolate the city? Can they hold that for the length of time it requires? Can you really cut off all supplies? So if you have, for instance, a city, say Manila, that's on a littoral and you do not control the sea lines of communication in and out, can you actually besiege the city? It would require a significant maritime or joint component to be able to do that, or placement of fires in a method to control by fire that s lock. If, say, you're besieging Leningrad and they have the ability to drive over a frozen lake during the entirety of the winter, that's going to be a problem for your ability to commit to the siege or an adversary's. Also, what is the likelihood that the enemy morale will collapse before they all die? Ultimately, you don't want to starve everyone to death. It's not a good approach, even for an adversary. What you're really hoping is at some point they'll get very hungry, very sad, realize it's all futile, and just give up. This requires a very good understanding of the mindset of the enemy and the enemy civilians. Again, I'm being agnostic. When I say you, I mean whoever is conducting this operation. I'm not suggesting that U.S. forces sit there and starve out another country. Um, do you really have the intel to understand the subterranean infrastructure that can support the cities and what areas you need to control? I think of this actually with one of Major Roth's case studies from his monograph of, I want to say it's the Vilna ghetto where they created an exfil and infiltration tunnel from the ghetto that went out into the deeply forested area and were able to bring supplies and move out people through that. You could think of the siege of Sarajevo as well. And if you just want to map in your head how far from New York City the aqueduct tunnels go before they emerge, you're well into upstate New York before those surface anywhere. So where, if you're locking down all of the end entrances and exits to the city, where do you actually need to go? For our British colleagues, if you think of where the underground infrastructure of London comes above ground, I believe uh, there's one old disused freight line that goes from central London to Chatham Royal Dockyard, all the way on the Thames Estuary, which can take ocean-going vessels. So you have an underground subterranean network that goes straight to an oceanic port. Um, and I believe that will put you some 40 miles, is that or so, from central London, Chatham, 30? Uh, a little bit further even right so when you're thinking of the area you need to cut off to do this do you actually have the forces and do you have a sufficient map of the subterranean infrastructure to understand where you have to cut off and are you prepared for the humanitarian situation post-surrender Right. Let's say their morale breaks. Now you have a very, very starving population. So all of the medical and phase four considerations we talked about just shoot right up. Right. We're in a whole new world of that bad. And finally, can you provide your own security? You must defend from relief efforts and you must defend from breakouts. This is a tremendous, tremendous effort to defend in two directions simultaneously. So let's say you don't want to do that. Let's talk about a different variation of this, which is control without entering. There's a case of this, which is Binge Bell in 2006. It does not work in that case, but it could work. That case just doesn't. Um, what you do is you're trying to control. You don't actually care about anything in the city. You have no particular goals in the urban area. However, your goal is to keep the urban area from affecting the conduct of your other operations. So say an urban area that sits adjacent to an MSR that gets you towards a major objective. You don't want to enter that urban area because you don't want the urban fight, but you do want to keep it from being able to impact that area. So what you do is you set up either on the seam in between the area you actually care about in the urban area, or you try to control by fire to keep anything coming from that urban area to affect you. Now, what you're doing, and this becomes a problem or the challenge, is you are totally sacrificing initiative. 
The forces in the urban area have 100% of the initiative. You have no initiative against them. And you're also taking casualties, right? Because they're going to just try to break through your defense over and over and over again. And since you have no particular interest in going to the urban area, you're not going to really be able to go against them. You're just going to have to take it for quite a while. So it has an indefinite time, too. How long do you have to hold this defense? Till it's no longer relevant, which if you're on an MSR, is until the war's over. Right? So it's indefinite time. It's an unclear objective, because what are you actually trying to do with the city? Just make it not somebody else's problem, which is a great objective to give to your subordinate commanders. Hey, brigade, I just need the city not to be a problem. Don't enter it but just make it not a problem for everyone else, right? This is something you can really make a good op order off of. It also, has, therefore, has a whack-a-mole approach. Because the adversary has the initiative, they can come out and attack you whenever you want, whenever they want, and so you're just constantly suppressing, suppressing, suppressing. The only time that I can think of to do this is when you have no objective in the urban terrain, right? When there is nothing you want from that urban terrain, but you, it does have a threat that can emanate from it, and there's something else you want adjacent to it. But it is an approach. Yeah? Uh, historically, another good example of when you use this is if you've got a good partner force, so you can actually use partner force, you might have more mass than you. To... That is like two slides later from now. Okay. Carry on. <laughs> um, I love that you're, this is how you know you have expertise in the room because they're like, yeah, you forgot to sing. And it like sets me up as like a preview for where we're going. My goal is to break these down operational approaches into their minimum possible variation. So like what is the simple, what is each boutique one? There are ways you can combine them, certainly. But the goal is to really give you a menu of very boutique approaches so you can really examine the considerations of it. So each variation is separate right now. And obviously, like, I don't know, in music, if you have multiple separate variations, you can play them together as well in kind of some kind of beautiful cacophonous symphony. Um, and that's true with these variations as well. So, in fact, one variation, work with support of local forces. So you isolate, but you use a local partner to provide you the majority of the combat power. Um, lots of examples of this through history. Um, in the Second World War, just because I every now and again want to give a little shout out to what I do really do research on, which is work with indigenous forces. You have a great one in the Horn of Africa, which is the siege of Debra Marcos in Ethiopia. But more recently, you, bless you, you have the Battle of Beirut in 1982, where the Israeli army was placing itself in support of what they recognized to be the government of Lebanon, which others would call the phalangist militia or the Catholic militia. Take your choice, depending where you are on the Lebanese civil war of who was legitimate or not. But it leads, it has some really, really key advantages. Um, one of its advantages, for instance, is you don't do the majority of the nasty part of the urban fighting, which is always a benefit for your force. If you're working with local partners, they'll probably know the city better than you, though that's not a guarantee. They may have more cultural awareness, again, not a guarantee, depending on the ethnic uh, makeup of the city, et cetera, et cetera. But it does lead you to some important questions. So how much support do you need to provide this local force? Right? What are they capable of by themselves? What type of support do you need to provide and how much of it? If you are the critical enabler and you're providing, say, fires, and they call, hey, where's our fires? And you say, yeah, we're out of that. How will that affect your strategic relationship with that local partner? Will they feel abandoned by you at their moment of need? And will that have knock-on strategic effects either immediately or down the line? So how much support will you need to provide and can you deliver on it? What kind of support will you need to provide? Do you have that support in your formation? So if you have a division that's fighting a battle, and is also providing support to a local partner as they fight an urban fight, your fires are now being called in two different directions. Right? You, so how do you prioritize? Do you support your local partner in the urban fight? Do you support your own forces? What kind of support will you provide? Sticky subject, but it's really relevant in the case of 1982. What if your local partner has a little bit of a flair for war crimes? not necessarily following the same standards that you are, 
At what point does your support constitute a war crime? Case in a point in 1982, there's a massacre going on by the Phalanges. They ask the IDF to provide illumination for an ongoing battle. The IDF does. Is providing illumination to allow a bat massacre to continue to go throughout the night part of the war crime? These are considerations that I will save for the legal team in the back, but certainly something if you're doing this where you are just sending in your local partner that you need to consider as part of planning. What are the second and third order effects, especially in multi-ethnic states, of employing that force? We can put this in Iraqi case. If you've got a Sunni town and you're sending in a Shia Iran-backed militia, perhaps there may be some second and third order long-term effects for using that, making that particular choice of force. And how long will you need to support them? Yeah, I can provide all the fires you need today. Can I continue this if the battle drags out? And finally, and I think most critically, can your plan survive their failure? If you're sending it to a partnered force, you lose an element of control. What if they lose? Can you still do what you were intending to do with the city? So there is a re it is a very good, there's a long track record of doing this. Of I, Your force provides the isolation for the city. The local force provides the main combat power in the city. But it is not a yay, easy button solution. You have a lot of planning considerations you need to bring to bear beforehand. Saha. Yeah, sorry. Um, this is such an interesting area of working with partner forces, and there's so much, so many lessons that we identified in uh, recent Operation Army in Iraq and Syria. The whole body of work about how you have harmony rules of engagement or training on law on conflict, on good practice to mitigate civilian harm. And they've been, there have been gaps in this uh, in the Operation for Raqqa and also in Mosul. Uh, but I think, you know, you're raising, uh, because then also how, I mean, I think you raise a very good point on how fires are coordinated. Uh, for example, in, uh, uh, and how you vet intelligence coming from a partner force, which can also be biased, um, uh, to, in, in, to take up their own enemies rather than having a more neutral approach. So there are a lot of things that, and there's a lot of lessons that can identify. Uh, but it, it's interesting, I wanted to just mention that, you know, again, um, uh, because some of the statistics that you've been citing in the different phases of assault. And again, if you just look at the recent operation, that if you look at Raqqa, which was US, anti -co uh, ISIS coalition air power um, in support of the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which was predominantly Kurdish in some areas, forces between February and October 2017, the operation was in a very high uh, uh, it was a very high um, tempo. And uh, a lot of munitions and artillery was used. 80% um, of the city was destroyed, 65% of the homes, 40 schools, five universities, 29 mosques, eight hospitals, um, and the city's irrigation water system was also destroyed. Uh, I mean, this is just a little come out from a, a recent report I would like to encourage everybody to read from the Rand Corporation, it's not just an NGO saying. Um, and again, it's this kind of push-pull factors uh, that you could be raising and also when you're working uh, with a partner force. So sorry, it's a comment nope. rather than a question. <laughs> I, I'm happy to talk on the side about a lot of the issues with partner forces uh, today or tomorrow. So I like, thank you for raising the numbers and that's really important to think about with assault. I'll give you a number for, isolate, for a full siege too, which is the siege of Leningrad. To maintain the siege of Leningrad, it required a continuous German and Finnish presence of over 700,000 soldiers maintaining the siege for a total of 872 days, right? The siege fails, but in its failure, it kills more than 500,000 people. Actually, it's the numbers are really higher over a million because at 500, Ah, sorry, I got my statistics backwards. That 500,000 is German total losses of the besieging force. And it immobilized the entirety of the German northern offensive operation because they had to keep pumping into the siege. So assaults are bad. Take up a lot of force. Don't think a siege or an isolation 
is your way out of these force numbers and is your way to take care of it. I'd like to go to one more really of sieges or in our uh, isolations which is siege to infiltrate or siege to assault. This is actually the most common historical example. You isolate the city or you besiege it, depending if you want to let in food and water or not. But you do this to change conditions and set conditions for a follow on operation, either to infiltrate forces in and seize key terrain. This would be um, the biblical siege of Jerusalem. Um, you can hear about it, actually. I think you talk about it with the City of David archaeologist on your podcast, right? So plug for his podcast. He actually talks about a case where this, where they are able to besiege and then see, send in a team to infiltrate the key water supplies and seize those and really cut off and force the city surrender. So your advantages if you're doing siege to infiltrate is it leverages those special operations capabilities, right? You're wearing down the defense, either through bombardment or through isolation. And then at a time and place of your choosing, you begin the infiltration process. So you don't just go, hey, we need to get the infiltration in here now, right? You wait till the conditions are what you want. So you've taken control of the city essentially by isolation. And now you've set conditions that you use to follow on infiltration at a time and place of your choosing. So, it, and similarly, the siege to assault, similar idea is you pick whichever form of assault you want, but if you've isolated the city, you're attriting the defenders through your isolation and through setting conditions, and then you assault again at a time and place of your choosing. So it's really thinking of phasing and transition where you begin with isolation and then you pick what you want to do next. So it mitigates the risks of either side. So it's faster than besieging or isolating indefinitely because you're transitioning to another type of operation, but you're attriting the adversary beforehand. You're learning more about the city because you're physically present around it, right? So it mitigates the risks of both. However, it may result in you ending up besieging the city. Why? You're like, okay, I've got these conditions that are going to be right for me to infiltrate my dudes, my soft bubbles. I'm, I got my right conditions. And then those conditions just don't happen, right? So you're just then sitting there doing a siege. And we're back to the problems of siege. It also may result in simply assault. Your siege and isolation did not significantly attrit the enemy. It didn't change conditions in the city terribly much. And so you've now wasted a whole lot of time that you could have already been in the assault phase. So it's disadvantages what happens if the conditions that you need to transition are met, which goes back to my point that phasing and transition is absolutely critical here. So your planning considerations are the ability of special operations to infiltrate. Are there key terrain that they can take and have a significant effect? As I mentioned, timing and transition, and then achieving surprise. If you're sitting there staring at the city and they're staring at the defender, they're staring at you and you're staring at them, they're staring at you, it becomes a lot harder to achieve surprise because they've now gotten used to your pattern of life. And when you alter it in any way to begin an assault or to begin infiltration, they'll be able to observe that because, well, they've been staring at you for quite a while by this point. And then finally, on the offense, before we get to some weird stuff, some radical change ones, bypassing. What if you don't really need to fight the city? Again, why do you want to, what is your objective here? If it's to take the city, then obviously you can't bypass it. If it's to take an S pod or A pod in the city, obviously you can't bypass it. But the advantage of bypassing the city is it makes the city the adversary's headache. They still have to supply it. Under a law of war, they're still in charge of the civilians. So you've just given them, continued to give them a problem of supplying an urban and sustaining an urban area that you're not in. It avoids all of those nasty problems that come from urban fights. Just don't do it. It essentially relies on the fact that eventually the enemy will just leave it. Why? Because you've bypassed it and the war's moved on and they're just sitting there stuck in a city doing nothing. So they'll go home eventually or maybe just surrender. Yeah, there are disadvantages though, which is what brings us to why we have this course, I suspect, which is what happens if the enemy doesn't withdraw, right? It's really good if they just go home. If um, any of you do have done the MC, the Warfighter Baltic scenario, 
the idea is you just bypass the city and then at some point the Denovians just go home and you don't have to fight your way through the city. And that's definitely what's going to happen, um, 100%. Bypassing the city can result in unintended sieges. You didn't really want to besiege the city, but the enemy didn't leave. And so now you're sitting across their line of supply. Oh, wait, now you're a besieging force. It just kind of happened. Um, and that's not really what you don't kind of want accidental phases and transitions. It's the antithesis of planning. And it leaves an open sore behind you. Even if you do bypass it and isolate it, you've now got a huge chunk concentration of enemy with a lot of civilian personnel in your rear area. And I'm pretty sure and someone from DTAC can correct me, but a lot of our tactical operations are about keeping the enemy out of our rear area. And so here you're just inviting them in. If you bypass, it's not really ideal. And then you have the problem of can you really bypass? And this is why we have Paris right here as a background, because in the Second World War, the US did not want to liberate Paris. Paris was a headache that we absolutely didn't need, didn't want, and couldn't sustain. It was not anywhere in our intent. Then the pesky Parisians start an uprising. And all of a sudden, the French units who are part of our coalition make a little bit of a right turn and start driving to Paris. And I can only imagine the radio net going all the way up to Bradley and Eisenhower of where are the French armor going? Oh, they're going unsupported to Paris. Wait, what? They were, what? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> there that. Um, but right. And so can you really bypass? Cities have a gravity all their own. They have a cultural gravity, a historic gravity, and at times a strategic gravity. So even if your plan sinks, you can bypass. Even if you're okay with all of this other stuff, can you really do it? At some point, will the city demand your presence? And if so, it's better to do it by pre-planning it than find it out as a surprise as the French units turn right, and you lose two armored divisions, basically, to that. And then their US partners start chasing them down to make sure they all don't get wiped out. And all of a sudden, your entire army is now turning in a different direction. Not ideal from a planning perspective. Yep. So I would do this. So, um, so, uh, so if you, I mean, we had a little giggle at the French expense. Read hell in a very small place. It's the Battle of Yedin Fu. It's French paratroopers. And it's maybe a strong point in, in the highlands of North Vietnam in a valley. And they lived there for months and months and months under extraordinary conditions. And just if you if you read that book all the way through and you want to make fun of the French uh, courage ever again, come see me. So I swear to God that I would never make fun of French courage after I read that, and I would stand up and say this every single time. So uh, read hell in a very small place. I'd also suggest the Battle of Bir Hakim in the North Africa, where the French decide to be the hedgehog to protect the entirety of the Allied army. And one uh, demi brigade, I believe it is, but I could be off on that, takes on the entirety of Africa Corps and is able to withdraw from being isolated in good order, having stopped the entirety of Africa Corps. Let's talk about some other options and some radical change options that, again, like bubbles, but even more so, we are not set up to achieve, do right now, nor would I think a boss be comfortable with it. So some other options. Re-engineer the city. You don't like the urban terrain, change it. <laughs> I'm only half joking. Pa uh, the reason I put it up in Paris is Napoleon III gets really tired of rebellions in Paris that are very hard for his National Guard to deal with and his gendarme to deal with. So the entirety of the street map you have of Paris in your head of big boulevards, parks, etc., that is defensive re-engineering of the city. He's like, I'm tired of all of these little alleyway fights. I'm going to build big, beautiful boulevards that I can just ride cavalry down. Absolutely re-engineers the city. For, mili for, at that point, an offensive military purpose to create avenues of approach into all of the more rebel areas. In that Battle of Janine I mentioned in 2002, what ends up getting extracting the Israeli forces and making it a costly success as opposed to a total failure is they're like, we can't move down these streets with our armor. We're going to build some new streets. And so they use their D9s and their engineering assets to cut a new street. Uh, wide enough for armor into the center of the city, and then they cut another one. And at that point, the forces in Janine start to surrender because they realize time is up, because now Israel can move its combined arms into the city. Why? Because they took the deliberate process of re-engineering the city. Now, 
there are definitely IHL and LOAC challenges if you decide you're going to build a road through what was formerly people's houses, especially without you know their permission. It is also engineering heavy, right? If you're re-engineering the city, the key word is engineer. Um, and so if you don't have the engineering assets able to do this and you can't request them, then you cannot do this option. It also requires time. Building roads is not fast. Knocking over neighborhoods, if you want to create, say, an open LZ or an APOD where there used to be a neighborhood, this is not so fast. It's doable, but not fast. And it requires specialist equipment and security for that equipment. So if this is your operational approach, the equipment you need to re-engineering the city should be on your critical protected asset list from square one. Because if you lose that equipment, your operational approach is now dead. Another thing you can do is raid to displace. So you, your issue is the enemy is in an urban area and you don't want them there. We've talked about very deliberate ways to actually drive them out. Another one is to attack their morale and their feeling of security. Through repeated raiding, you can make them feel their position is untenable and they will withdraw. So this is not trying to capture the city. This is move, uh, repeatedly raiding, which uh, of course the doctrine is entering in then a planned withdrawal. So the point is to create psychological effects on the enemy or logistical effects on the enemy to make sure to make them feel that their position has become untenable. And so they will withdraw from the position. It minimizes risk, right? You're not sending in large forces. Any one of your raids fails. That's very unfortunate. But it is not an operational risk. You can continue to do it. It is dependent on, however, weaknesses in enemy morale and organization because really you're trying to create a psychological effect on your adversary. It avoids some of the problems of urban combat, but it does have the disadvantage that really the enemy has their vote of when, it is, when it's worked or if it will work. You, there could be an adversary that you raid every day and they're just like, oh, six in the morning, it's time for the daily hate and uh, let's get on with our day after that. There's a new concept coming out of Israel that John and I were privileged to get briefed on that's worth talking about. That is a radical change, which is how they're doing MDO. They're starting MDO at the battalion level and building it up towards what it will look like at a division level rather than where we're sitting at division and building it down. What they divide their battalion into is three elements, an expose element, a convergence element, and a strike element. This is based for urban operations. The idea is that in an urban environment, targets present themselves for only a very, very brief period of time and present themselves for at a time of their choosing. They can always hide. And so what they do is the expose element, the job is to go and force those targets to reveal themselves by engaging them, by using a lot of electronic warfare as well, and by using deception. So it's got a combat element on electronic warfare and deception and psyops element in it. Now the purpose again is to make those targets expose themselves. This allows the convergence force to coordinate a response to it, um, which will involve again, cyber, electronic, and actual strike. And then finally the strike force whose job it is to destroy the target and or conquer the area that the target was in. What's important about this is that it is only lateral communication. At the battalion level, the battalion commander steps back. It is not bubbles where the battalion commander is trying to do, hey, you're my main effort now, now you're my main effort now, now you're my main effort. The battalion commander is out of the loop on this. Requires incredible trust in subordinate organizations and capabilities. The convergence element, and by some descriptions of it, also has a logistics element to support the other two. There's some confusion, I think, about that um, as they're trying it out and playing with it. Again, it's based on the idea that targets are only briefly, briefly available and are only targets of opportunity. However, what it requires is a mixed task force at the lowest echelon. So exposed units and strike units are, have organic air, sauce, engineer, recon, EW, cyber. So we're talking essentially companies that are mixed task forces of all of those elements. So it's really pushing those enablers down to an exceedingly low level. It was a concept in that it was used in part of the deception campaign in the latest Gaza operation to a high degree of success. 
Um, and it, again, it makes heavy, heavy use of deception because the real thing about this is they also now call this a fires infantry concept. Everything is about exposing targets to be killed by fires. Yeah. Is there an English language publication on this you can recommend? No. There may be at some point. There is not currently. I think New York Times something ran a story on that, right? Because they're very successful where the So they ran a story on the deception part in the Gaza campaign, but not this unit. This unit where it was part was involved in that. Um, I kid you not, the unit tran name translates. Let no one say Tom Clancy has no effect as um, the Ghost Reconnaissance Battalion or Ghost Recon Battalion um, <laughs> is the name of the unit. And it's an experimental unit. What they've done is they've given it the best of everything to see if this concept works. And now they're working on how would this look at a brigade level? Right, what changes if you're trying to do this at a brigade level, and then they'll eventually move to a division level. So right now it has its own fixed wings assets as well. So when I say they've just given it everything, I literally mean it's like that uh, scene in, what is it, The Professional or Leon, the guy's like, everyone, that's what they've done for this. It's, it's got everything you could ever want to enable this approach. But it is an approach that's shown so far a fairly high degree of effect but it would require a radical change of the structures that we're comfortable with in command and coordination to make it happen. Last one of the offensive concepts I will talk about is the Soviet late Second World War concept. I'm not saying this is what they did. They did all the time. I'm saying this is their concept. Essentially, what the division does is it divides itself into five elements or roughly brigade elements. So the first element is the breaching element. This is heavily enabled by fires and engineers, and the breaching element breaches the initial defense of the city and culminates at that point. It does not try to move forward. So throw everything you can at the breach, let it culminate. It then immediately moves to reconstitution, and we'll get to why in a second. The next force is a light force. This force's job is to move through the urban area very rapidly, identifying areas of concentrated resistance, um, and otherwise dislocating or clearing the enemy that is not in significant areas of concentrated resistance. Once it identifies those areas of concentrated resistance, it ignores them and bypasses them and marks them and indicates them to hire. Why? Because it's followed up by the assault force. The assault force is where you really get your combined arms force. The light forces dismount with some engineers. The combined arms force is slower moving, and it makes it, it supports the initial breach. It's really the second force in the breach or the follow on of the breach. But the key air piece of it is once those defended areas are identified, this is who deals with them. Your light forces do not deal with them. They're more like a reconnaissance force, but their idea is to also clear lightly defended areas. This goes to a point that Stuart Lyle made in the helicopter really well yesterday. You're not defending anywhere, everywhere when you're defending a city. So this is to really clear those areas that the enemy is not con uh, concentrated in the defense and then allow a force to take the defense. At this point, once the assault forces have opened up something could to an MSR, another force leapfrogs through, executes a forward passage of lines and prepares to move on beyond the key to the next phase line. Now, this force is whatever force did the breach in the previous operation. So this is a constant leapfrogging. Your breach force reconstitutes and becomes your reserve and then becomes the leapfrog force for the next operation. And whoever was the leapfrog force for the next operation is then the breaching, then they'll reconstitute, et cetera, et cetera. So it's cycle. Your last force to come in in your task organized is your clear and hold force. It's infantry, military police, intel, civil affairs, some engineering. And it, it is literally, at least in the case of Berlin, goes room to room through the whole city, taking whatever time it takes. It is the force that is there forever and a day. And it is very MP and infantry centric. And that's all it's ever going to do in its service. It is never going to be a breaching force. It's never going to be a maneuver force. It is task organized to go slowly and methodically. So let's talk to defense. Do you guys need another five minute break or are we good to keep rolling? Keep rolling? All right. Defense. Let's talk preparing for the defense. The first consideration we don't talk about a lot when preparing for the defense is long-term preparation for the defense. Again, there are countries 
who know they are going to potentially be a frontline country and know their urban areas are potentially the front line that needs to be defended. There are things you can do to prepare for this. So one is city design. Create neighborhoods in key terrain. Turn that key terrain that has overwatch over your city into part of the city, into an urban area. And don't just do that, lay out a street plan that supports the defense. This is something that has been done historically. Can you, yeah. So you cannot argue at all that the Ukrainians have not been preparing to defend Ukraine. Right. Uh, arguably about their authorization as a military to be in position for the defense. But clearly in the first phase, they prepared for a long time how they were going to defend, especially key. Absolutely. And there are ways to take that to the next level even, and that's work with the city planners, work with the national government to create neighborhoods, to create that thing. You can also do dual use buildings. This is one of my favorite buildings to see. It's because it's still lounged in Jerusalem, so you can go see it. It's an apartment building, right? It's an apartment building that sat on the border with Jordan right in front of this wall, which didn't have doors. If you go before 67, this is where the minefield between Jordan and Israel began. But it's a city, so people have to live. The city has to have normal life, but it's also the front line. What you'll notice about this apartment building is, first of all, originally it has no entrances on the ground floor facing the Jordanian side. Second of all, it has a curtain wall around the bottom, so an obstacle that can also keep breaching charges and create a second obstacle for breaching, can keep shells away from the base of the building. Third, what you'll notice is the windows are very small and slit-shaped, right? Kind of looks a little bit strong point-esque. Fourthly, it's very thick concrete reinforced with rebar. And fifth, you have these weird drainage holes all along the roof wall that look very good for rifles, right? This is what you can do if you know, or if you're working with a partner who knows the offense may, may be coming at some point. This is a tremendous advantage because you're no longer trying to be like, hey, where do I build a strong point or an obstacle? You know how quickly this building turned into a defensive thing in 1967 when the Jordanians did try to attack this neighborhood? About four minutes, right? The civilians left the apartment building in a pre-drilled, here's how you leave, here's your school bus, get on it, go, and the machine guns came in. Very, very effective, but it's if you have time. But you have to build, understand that the city ecosystem must function. Your defensive works, if you're on the long-term preparation side, cannot get in the way with this, of the function of the city. It's still got to be a city and it's got to work. You can only start to disrupt that when you get to short-term defense. And then if you're helping a partner do this, or if you're a partner who is doing this, what construction engineering assets do you have to help them with this? Again, this is not what we think of as no typical military engineering. We're not really used to having combat engineers build apartment buildings. And yet, very effective. Let's move on to short term. First question you need to ask is, beyond the urban environment itself, what are the critical parts of the urban envelope, the area around the urban environment that can affect it? And who is defending them? Is that your area of responsibility as well? Is that somebody else's area of responsibility and how are you coordinating with them? So for instance, and I always get this wrong, but I do believe the majority of LA's water comes from the mountains, uh, reservoirs in the mountains above LA and behind LA. Is that right? Anyone in LA knows? It comes from Disha, which is about five hours north. They own the land there. And where is the key water reservoirs right to get into here? Right, we built up five on the grapevine. They pump water in from the Central Valley. Also, some comes in from the east from the Colorado River. Okay, so that's a, criti a critical area for LA. Is that your division's AO if you're defending it? And if not, who is it? How do you coordinate to make sure that they don't think about just withdrawing from that without letting you know in advance? Is there a terrain feature, say, thinking of Rajesh and Miniature, is there a hill or terrain feature that allows you to bypass the majority of the urban defenses to get in towards that strategic terrain? Who's defending that? Right, you have to coordinate, identify as part of your IPB and reverse IPB, what are those critical areas for the city that are not in the city and make sure someone at hire is aligning a defense to them. Otherwise, your defense of the city is all but useless or can be depending on conditions. Secondly, 
can you leverage and alter pre-existing infrastructure? John's point about Keith, right? There's pre-existing infrastructure there. What can you do to it to make it super unpleasant and uncomfortable for an attacker? Can you, all other strategic and cultural locations, right, going back to some of those things with, uh, that Stuart brought up of some very tall, significant international buildings or areas that are culturally important. I forget who brought up museums filled with artifacts. What about the capital of a country, right? If an enemy's flag is flying over the capital, that can have a very significant psychological effect on that country. So are there, is there terrain that even if it doesn't make strategic sense to defend, you have to defend, you have to hold it. And can you negate its value through IO? Say, hey, yeah, they're taking, they, they may take the capital, but the, I don't know, the heart and soul of the real cat center of, the, of our country is the people, not the capital, right? Can you start getting that message out and will it resonate? Or is it a place where they're going to be focused, hey, they took our capital, we're done? Right. Um, I would suggest if you want to throw to old school, look at Charles, Cal Charles Caldwell's book on insurgency, small wars and insurgencies, not for the insurgency part in this case, but because he starts to help you think about how different cultures focus national and political identity. And this becomes very important for if you're going to negate the value of a culturally significant terrain. And again, do you have the right type of engineers? Do you have engineers who can assault, uh, fix the existing terrain or put out the obstacles? Or do you just have people that are packing a lot of explosives? Which can also be useful. But what do you have? Last thing of preparing for the defense I want to talk about is civil resiliency. And I apologize for the graphic. This is going to be one of two that are Jacob Stoyle drawn. And I'm really bad at drawing. So. I want to give you the concept of civil resiliency, which is slightly different from just civilian considerations. It's how are you making use of and working with the civilian population? And what I've done is helpfully made this army E, so color-coded as a spectrum from red to green. Where do you want the civilian population to be? Ideally, if you're on the defense, you want the civilian population in that dark green, that they are taking an active role in the defense of their city. Now, that can be digging anti-tank ditches, that can be putting up obstacles, that can be giving you intel about where enemy movements, or that can be making Molotov cocktails and dropping them on unlucky soldiers. Or if they don't have those, just pieces of building material works as well, right? This is where you want the civilian population because you want them as a force multiplier for you. If you can't get them there, you want them here. You want them figuring out ways to support their own needs and survival because that takes them off your logistical and medical, uh, you know, stocks, basically. If they're supporting themselves. You don't need to support them. Minimum, you want them to be able to advocate for its own needs. You want them to be in that pull thing. So you're not trying to figure out how to supply the civilian population. The civilian population is coming to you and saying, hey, we have X number of casualties here. This is how many of them are walking wounded. This is how many need your medical attention. This area is short of food. This area is short of water. So you're not trying to just push out supplies to the civilian population. They're actually advocating for themselves. But we can fall down the spectrum, right? You can have the population advocate for surrender or take part in non-cooperation with you, refuse any contact with you. Under international law, you are still responsible for their well-being, even if they're not talking to you. Right? So you don't want to be in that situation. And even going down to civil disobedience, protests, etc., and advocating surrender will have a morale effect on your forces as well as on the nation. And where you really don't want them to get is right down here, is taking part in resistance, insurgency, civil disorder, or other measures that undermine defense. To return to my earlier slide, this is why I said for the defense, phase four is phase zero. How do you get the civilian population? How do you build its resiliency? How do you build your, its capacity to help you? That's those phase four considerations. That's working with civil affairs. It's figuring out what the civil population needs. That's providing it. And that's providing it the resources and education to be a partner in defense and bringing it on side. Even if they don't like you, you can still get them into that yellow green box, right? Even if they really don't like you, you can convince them that they are partners with you in their own survival. So 
civil resiliency is a necessary precondition of successful defense, and it must begin before phase three. So in this case, again, phase four is phase zero, one, two for the defense. And again, I apologize for the weird floating words. It's what happens when I try to draw things. I am not a PowerPoint ranger. So key considerations as you're planning for the defense overall. Enemy capabilities and objectives. Why are they coming to the city? Similar, like I said, why are you defending, attacking the city? Why is the enemy attacking the city? This should let you know part of what they're going to do and what operational approach they're going to take. Is there strategically or culturally significant terrain for them? Right? Are there places where they think they need to go because it's strategically or culturally significant to their overall war plan? So again, this brings back end states and conditions, right? What is the natural terrain of the city? I love being in the helicopter with Sturdo there. Why? Because he kept pointing out terrain matters. Terrain matters. It's not just urban terrain. Physical terrain matters. What terrain can you alter in the city? Right? So there's an interestingly canalized river sitting in Manila where it clearly is a river that wants to be someplace that it's not. Um, and you can tell this because it works in a dead straight line, which nothing in nature does. Um, so can you alter that for your own purposes of defense? What of the terrain are you stuck with and what can you alter? Or in Kiev, right, can I flood stuff? Can I take down bridges? What can I do to alter the urban terrain? And then lastly, again, that civil population consideration. I can't emphasize that one really enough. So what are your choices? What are your operational choices for defense? I promise we're getting near the end here. I think I have like 10 slides left now. 20? I don't know. But we're getting near the end. I know it's getting late. So preemptive withdrawal. This is very similar to the thing of bypassing. Why are you defending the city? Do you actually need to defend the city? Do you want to defend the city? What is the purpose? So can you just leave? Has some advantages. It avoids attritional warfare. If you are like an AB, if you're an ar heavy armored division and are not particularly well set up for an urban fight, but you have been to NTC 15 times and you kill on the maneuver in open terrain, maybe don't fight in the city. Maybe be where you can have the advantage. It prevents from being trapped in the city. We'll come back to that in a historical case. It allows for flexible defense, right? You withdraw, and now you're into open space. You can get moving, especially if you think about LA. If I don't want to fight in LA, and I can withdraw to the east, well, then I'm literally fighting in NTC, and we've all done that, and so you should be good at it. Um, but it's a fight you might want to have. It leaves the adversary with significant logistical challenges. They now own the city, which means they have to do all of those phase four considerations that we've just been talking about are quite hard. However, you've just seeded the urban area and its population. This may uh, significantly hurt morale, especially if it's your own territory, right? If it's not your own territory and it's host nation, it may be considered a breach of faith with your allies and have significant morale and strategic, and even grand strategic impact for doing that, that lasts far after the war in terms of, oh yeah, you're the people who betrayed us and let all the population in the city die. We don't like you anymore, right? There are really good historical examples. My favorite one, however, is the German mistake on what they called fortress cities. Hitler was really into urban terrain as culturally significant, and he'd ordered his forces to defend it no matter what. Budapest is a very good example. Budapest, by this point in the war, had zero strategic value. And they commit to the urban fight in Budapest. And what that does is it leaves a significant portion of the German army trapped in Budapest, where the Soviets are like, great, you're not on our main axis of advance. This is awesome. We'll destroy you in Budapest, but we'll also keep going. So we'll destroy you at a time in Budapest that we find convenient, and the rest of us will keep going because you're no longer de uh, defending against our main axis of advance. So you don't always want to fight the urban battle. Ask yourself, why am I fighting the urban battle even on defense? Don't be the U old US joke from World War II. We're here because we're here because we're here because we're here, right? And shouldn't be doing that. So considerations for deciding to withdraw preemptively, can you defend the urban terrain? If you don't have the capabilities to defend the urban environment, don't do it, right? If you, if you can't do it, don't do it. It should be obvious, but it's not always, i.e. Budapest. Um, is your floor suited to urban defense? If we go in micro and you're literally just, you know, got some heavy armor and that's it, maybe this is not the place for you. 
Um, would you benefit from maneuver defense? Why are you defending the city? What is the significance of the city? What is the status of the civilian population? Do they all really want to be part of the enemy? And you've really messed up the civil resiliency considerations and you're going to fight the adversary and a huge insurgency and this is going to become untenable. Can your position be bypassed? Can they ignore you in the city and just go around and hit whatever their main objective is? Are you now superfluous to requirements by defending the city? And lastly, can you leave a stay behind force to deny them control? A force that essentially sacrifices itself, but makes them fight an urban fight while the majority of your force withdraws. Essentially a guerrilla force or a denial of control within the city. Another for alteration is a city as basing or as a fortress of last resort. In this case, you defend outside the urban environment while retaining the ability to fall back into the urban area for basing and staging. So you have your fires, your command and control all in the urban area, and you build layered defense leading back to the urban area. This is the case of the Battle of Leningrad. The Soviet defense of Leningrad extended far from the city and were success, uh, had subsequent waves of defense in depth until they got to the city itself. So. Its advantages are protect the urban uh, population and environment. Hopefully, you defeat the enemy at your earlier stages, and so they're not actually fighting in the city. So you're, it is the maximum protection for the population. It presents multiple challenges to the enemy because they have to breach your defenses and then get ready for the urban battle. So it requires a multiple breaching multiple layers. It makes use of other terrain besides the urban environment. I'm not going to really run through all of these because they're on the board. Um, but I want to highlight some of the negatives. It is time intensive in preparation. You have to build your defenses out from the urban environment. Most more likely to result in a siege. The enemy may look at that big defended area and go, I'm not fighting through that. That seems like a terrible idea. Why don't I just, you know, cut you off entirely, right? Not what you want to have happen. And it also has the possibility of rapid collapse because your defense isn't in the city. If they penetrate rapidly those outer quadrants of defense, you may find your defense in bypass. This happens at the third battle of Tobruk, which didn't result in a siege because when the Germans arrived, they found a weak point in the defense, broke through, and that was it for the city. And suddenly everyone in the city who is expecting to hold out for six to eight months finds himself totally bypassed and has to surrender. So it does have the possibility of rapid collapse. So you've got, again, Leningrad and Tobruk for some historical cases to look at this. Another one is the city as a fortress. In this case, your objective is to decisively defeat the enemy breach and hold the city intact. So as whereas the out one, you're preventing the enemy breach. Here you are going to wait for the enemy to breach and you are going to decisively defeat it and keep the city intact. Advantage, you now take advantage of defensive qualities of urban terrain, right? Because you're really fortifying that urban terrain. It allows to transition to defense in depths or other forms of defense, and it protects strategically and culturally significant terrain in the city because the enemy, if you do this right, is not penetrating into the city. They'll make a breach and you'll defeat them at the breach. So it does allow for a decisive operation. Of course, the disadvantage is if you think of Monty's colossal cracks, this is all based on the point that an attacker is strongest at the point of breach. So really you're doing you're matching their strength with your strength, very Clausewitzian. Here's their main effort, here's my main effort, good to meet you, let's pound it out. Right, this is a Clausewitzian approach to city defense. It requires a high, it can require a high force ratio, and the enemy ultimately chooses a point of breach, so the enemy has initiative, and it risks breakthrough. If this doesn't work, then they can break through the city and negate all of your defenses. Moving from that is envelop and counterattack. Your goal here is not to defeat the breach. It is to allow the enemy to breach, maybe contest it, but allow the enemy to the breach. Once they've breached, now they're in your urban terrain. You've had time to prepare the defensive. All of those things John actually writes about in his handbook of channeling the enemy, etc. But critically, you can now cut them off. They're in your playground. Right? They've also used tremendous effort on the breach, and so they no longer have the same level of force that they had when they initially breached. So you have attrited them, or they've attrited themselves, they've used their supplies, and now they're in your playground, they're in your home. So you can regain the initiative by enveloping that force that has now established that foothold. It allows most of the city to function normally because that's not where fighting is. You're fighting at the point of their foothold. It also allows for a decisive 
approach because if you can cut off and eliminate that force that they float in, chances are they're going to try to keep supplying it and keep it intact. And so they're going to flow more and more forces in basically a sunk cost fallacy if you're going successfully here. Of course, your risks doesn't work. You've allowed them to breach, and now your counterattack fails, and now you're basically done. That's, that's it. You've been put paid to, um, and your defense is really no longer relevant. Um, and it allows the enemy to gain a foothold in urban terrain. So if you don't want them to gain a foothold, don't take this approach. Um, it also requires the ability to coordinate for, and transition, and it's a high coordination problem from that initial defense of the breach, the contesting the breach, to your counterattack. Good example of this to think about is the Battle of Suez City. Jason and John have written a good case of that. I think they also interviewed on the uh, podcast one of the uh, officers who helped command that little bit of a debacle. Um, and so you can look at that. That essentially was what it was. The Israelis were successfully able to breach into the urban area. They established a foothold, and then they were enveloped uh, during the counterattack and were forced to withdraw at incredible cost. Um, so you can look at that as an example of this. I know I'm moving somewhat fast, but I do have an eye on we are way over time. So we're almost done, I do promise. Um, zonal defense. This is setting up the city into multiple zones, a rear zone and a battle zone, or multiple independent zones of defense. So in the other ones, you're trying to fight the city or defend the city as a whole entity. Here, you're doing what we're much more comfortable with, which is defining a rear area, an engagement area, a close area, all of those different areas. A really... What it relies on, however, in my opinion, is significant terrain features that allow you to protect your rear area. One of the problems that actually, I think, again, I'm really going back to this helicopter ride, man. You're great on it, is he talked about is making a defense in a city is a little bit artificial if it's a big city with lots and lots of different pathways through because you defend an area. And my choice can be to engage that or it can be to find a different route and hit you somewhere else. So, but if you have some kind of barrier in Stalingrad, the Volga River, that makes that hard or impossible, then you can really take a zonal defense. You can put your fires on one side, your supply on one side, your reserve on one side, and force the enemy to do battle with you on the other side. And this is really the case with Stalingrad. It's fundamentally attritional because you're staying, you're staying on the defense and you're trying to attrit the enemy while you're on the defense, taking advantage of your superior now organization. It favors the use of fires and enablers because behind that line of protection, you can mass fires in a way you can't mass if you are just spread out throughout the urban area. It creates more and less protected areas for civilians. So on the other side of your safe line, it's more protected for civilians. And in your battle zone, very little protection for civilians because that's where both sides are going to contest. It also risks the loss of strategic and cultural terrain. Why? Because it might be in that battle zone. And so you're not going to work to protect it as much because this is an enemy-focused approach. It is not a specific terrain-focused approach. Yeah. So I'm not talking specifically a safe zone. I'm talking an area where you're probably not having people doing room clearing and throwing grenades into basements and stuff like that. And yeah, a safe zone is a whole other. I'm saying where your logistics and supplies are, if they're on the other side of a protected barrier, makes it less likely that the civilians will be targeted by small arms and will have people fighting across their dinner table and things like that. Still, fires and things will be indirect will be a significant problem for them. I believe this is my second to last one on defense, um, which is defense in depth. Uh, yes, this is my second to last one on defense. Oh, fantastic. Um, and this is, again, you can tell my great graphical skills, right? You should recognize, you know, I don't even need to sign my artistry. It's automatically recognizable. Um, I don't really need to go over the principles of defense in depth because it is very, very doctrinal. We all should know them. Um, but it is attritional in nature. It allows for the maximum exploitation of any defensive advantage in the urban terrain because you're creating multiple successive lines to fall back through. So if one area is well good to defend and then the next area and then the next area, you get to fall back through all of them if you need. Um, obviously trading space for time. And it's achievable with a disadvantageous force ratio because you're taking, you're using fixed uh, defense and fortification. Um, it's achievable with an infantry heavy force if you don't have a lot of combined arms. 
again, risks that loss of strategic or key cultural terrain. But what I want to ca concentrate on is one type of defense in depth, which is what I have graphically depicted up here very poorly. I'm afraid I really need like a staff captain or something um, who can draw who my drawing for me, who's come through the career course and therefore knows how to draw very well on PowerPoint. Um, but essentially, which is what I call small area defense in depth. So defense in depth is great if you've got a large area to do it in and multiple areas to trade, right? Doctrinally, you're trading space for time. But there's another way to trade space for time, which is retrading the same space over and over and over again for time. This is what I call small area defense in depth or SAD because I'm terrible at coming up with acronyms. Um, and essentially, it ties to Major Roats' brief on the urban area. What you have is you have the assaulting force breaches the first line of defense, fights their way through it, fights their way through subsequent lines of defense, and gets to their main objective and is culminated as is generally planned for, right? Your breach force culminates before they can exploit beyond the breach. However, you as a defender use, in most cases I've seen this, the subterranean environment to re-infiltrate those exact same defensive lines or defensive positions. So when the second echelon or follow-on forces comes to move into exploitation into the enemy rear, into the rear area, what do they find? They have to fight their way through the exact same problem that the initial breaching force and assault force fought their way through. And you do this as many times as you can, and essentially each echelon culminates on an objective. We can think, if we really work at it, tons of examples of this historically. We can think of the Vietnam War, what became known as Hamburger Hill, for instance. We can think of some of the battles in the Pacific. So um, who hasn't mentioned Iwo Jima and the flag raising, right? They get to the main objective, and then they have to, the follow-on force has to fight their way right back up that same mountain. Why? Because the Japanese were leveraging subterranean environment. It's even easier to do in the city. And when we think about verticality, there are other ways to hold your force unobserved to reinfiltrate the same area. We also see this commonly in the Second Lebanon War, as well as a common tactic that Hezbollah has. And there is some indication that Iran considers this as part of their mosaic defense within Iran as well, of the ability to just consistently reinfiltrate the same positions. So what does this mean if you're countering it? Well, you can't allow logistics to travel unescorted, right? Any logis if you get your forces here and you want to reconstitute them and you're sending supplies by this route, they're going to run into the exact same enemy defensive positions. Kazovac, you want to send casualties back through this area? The enemy has already reoccupied it. And so it presents a fundamental problem. Yeah? Is, is this comparable with delay operations? Depending on the goals, you want to achieve with it. I, the delay can be the objective of it, or the objective can be just to continue to hold this indefinitely, right? That's really a resourcing question. What is your ability to continue to re-infiltrate? So you can use this as a delay technique, but essentially what it is, is it's using the concept of defense in depth of trading space for time, but rather than doing that laterally, you're almost doing that vertically, right? You're using the same space by enabling the vertical space. The last thing to think about in defending the city is denial of control. You may be in a situation where you cannot stop the enemy from exercising their will on the city by breaching, by establishing that foothold, by maneuvering to that key strategic terrain. If you are not in a position to stop that, you do have another option, which is denying them control of the city. Now, this, of course, starts with IPB. Why do they want the city? If they don't care about control of the city, then denying them control isn't particularly useful. But if they do want control of the city, now we've got game on. It's particularly effective when facing significant overmatch. If you are a poor infantry bat battalion who finds itself in a city unable to withdraw and are facing, I don't know, a core, if you do any of the other operational approaches, all you're doing is inviting very creative ways to die. But by denial of control, you move something closer to a guerrilla campaign. Not necessarily a guerrilla. You can fortify areas of the city to deny them control, to make it not worth their air while to take it, especially if you have some fire assets, fires assets in those areas that can affect other parts of the city. So you're denying them control of the city, but you're not trying to hold the city. It is fundamentally attritional in nature. You are not going to be able to achieve a decisive defeat on the enemy. Your goal is to make them decide to leave. 
it is an option. We should not think of this as just an option for insurgents. It is a valid option on the defense for anyone, especially in urban terrain, especially in urban terrain that has subterranean elements to it. But it starts with why does the enemy want the urban terrain? Last couple things I'll mention are what we do when we move beyond thinking about offensive defense. And I'll move through those very quickly because this is a LISCO focused course, but you should think of them as operational approach. The first one is to get defending against urban areas hybrid threat. If you are now in phase four and you have an urban area that is held either outside your control or by an adversary militant group, and you don't really care about taking it, you in fact don't care about that urban area at all, but you do care about the threat emanating from it, there are ways you can handle that threat that are not taking the city. And we can look at isolating it from your area, from the area of your control, through physical barriers, right, as you see here and here, uh, or in fact, here. <laughs> Berlin Wall, exactly. That is isolating one urban area from another, right? You can use raiding to disrupt the enemy within that area, and you can combine that with physical separation. You can also do what I call semi-isolation. So this is the modern Kalandia checkpoint, um, which is a little bit different from the old Kalandia checkpoint, but essentially it processes 26,000 people through it every single day while maintaining the isolation of Kalandia. So those who have IDs, or actually those who have biometric IDs, can go through it, 26,000 a day. Those who don't, can't. And what it allows is it keeps this area, which is Kalandia, from this area with Aita, which are, in fact, two different countries, um, at least according to the Israelis. It gets debatable under international law what this area falls under. But the goal is to be able to allow Kalandia to function as an urban area, right, and work in its traditionally twin cities, while at the same time isolating the threat that can emanate from it and controlling that threat. And this is mixed with raiding into that to disrupt the threat. So just to think about one of the things we don't talk about is how do you protect from an urban area if the urban area is not under your control, especially if we're thinking peacekeeping or other forms of operation. And lastly, just to think about different ways to do consolidation of gains um, and preserve security within the city again as we move to that phase four and beyond. And we're not really going to talk too much about this, but I suggest if you look at the history of what's successful, you flip the who's leading the operations. So in a lot of the more successful cases, maneuver forces become subordinated to intelligence elements, which I think is a really interesting way to think about it. And historically, this has happened repeatedly. I mean, it really flips our idea of who's subordinate and who is enabler. The goal is to build both resiliency. You can re-engineer the city as seen here. I remember using this photo. I want to say it's Belfast there where they re-engineered the city by creating walls and I think they're called peace lines, is it? Yeah. Using the word peace a lot in the re-engineering of the city and, and peace gates instead of checkpoints. Um, so what are your planning considerations to be able to do this effectively? One, do you have cultural and geographic understanding? If you don't, then intelligence-led operations and re-engineering the city is just going to be awkward and unsuccessful. You need diverse teams because you need to be able to have women, you need to have, be able to have cultural experts. You really need to branch out who's in that decision-making team. And again, your actual maneuver element is really the subordinate on this. They are not as important as everything else. They are simply the reach out and touch part of the other parts of your team. And to do this effectively, speed matters. The time in which it takes to identify and act on a security threat during this phase four, especially if you're in the transition phase to three to phase four, is decisive, which means trust in small units and junior personnel. So you do not have time for an incident go to go all the way company, battalion, brigade, division, and then come back down with, okay, yeah, authorization strike, go here, go there, reorient a patrol. And so what you require is a lot of faith in junior personnel to make those decisions. And again, this is looking across the panoply of history. On average, what makes these oper types of operations successful? So we're not necessarily talking coin here, but we are talking security and stability as part of that phase four effort. With that, I went way over time. 
I apologize, but not really, because I hope you learned something from this. I hope it was useful. And I'm happy to take questions in an organized, or if the general just wants everyone out of here, I will stand out in the sun, get some fresh air, and take as many questions in a disorganized manner as you would like. Thank you very much. There's me on Twitter, because John forgot it for the first couple of days, because he hates me.